Hello, friends. Oh, boy. We're back at it tonight. I'm so excited to be with you. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're talking, we're going to respond to a video, an interview uh, of Mark Driscoll and Russell Johnson. Um, man, I listen, I know that we've talked about Mark the past few weeks here and there. We did a video, I think even a few weeks ago, about, about some of his stuff. Um, the reason why is because he's exploding right now in the conservative, charismatic, Christian nationalist space and picking up a ton of traction. His Instagram account has more than tripled. I think he has like 380,000 followers. And one thing about Mark I've noticed is that is that he's really a great communicator. And he seems to be picking up on some new language uh, to now kind of fit within a charismatic Christian nationalist framework. The problem is that a lot of what he says when you really unpack it, is not only dangerous, it's pretty freaking nonsensical. So tonight we are going to respond with someone that I've had the pleasure of meeting only a few weeks ago. Uh, I brought him on the podcast and then I met him uh, last week at Theology Beer Camp and it is great to have Dr. Kevin Carnahan here with us. Uh, Kevin, it's great to be here with you. Thanks for making time. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. Thank you, my friend. We actually, here's the episode that we did. I had you on the podcast talking about Israel and Palestine, kind of giving the history. Uh, and I got to say, it's one of our most downloaded episodes ever. Over 11,000 people have listened to it on the podcast. I think it has a couple thousand views now here on YouTube. And so, friends, if you're looking for a really great um, brief overview of kind of how we got here between Israel and Palestine. I recommend that episode. It's on podcasts and on YouTube. Um, but Kevin, why don't you go ahead and, and, and introduce yourself for the audience? Give us a brief background. Okay. So I am Kevin Carnahan. I'm a professor of philosophy and religion at Central Methodist University. I've written a couple books, mostly on political theology, uh, just war, I was the co-editor of the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics. Uh, and so I've been out in kind of uh, Christian scholarship for a while. I am myself a uh, United Methodist, uh, a good Wesleyan. Um, <laughs> so that made some, for some good jokes at beer camp. Um, uh, some fun going back and forth with the uh, Presbyterian that I was on stage with. Um, but yeah, that's my basic background. Awesome. Um Okay, so we're going to get into this video. Now, I got to say, Kevin, you're my favorite guest ever because you actually took the video, you spliced it up for me and said, here you go, here's a whole video that we condensed down into about 15, 20 minutes of all the good stuff. And I go, wow, uh, feel free to come on the show anytime if that's the new standard <laughs> because you saved me a lot of legwork. Of course, friends, the goal of this is never to dehumanize people. It's never to make fun of them um, or to uh, belittle who they are as humans. Both Kevin and I believe that every human is made in the uh, image of God, and that's important to us. Now, of course, we are going to critique the uh, the rhetoric. We're going to critique the ideas. Of course, that's up for grabs, but we're not here to belittle them as human beings. Now, um, Kevin, I have a confession. I didn't tell you this. Um, I'm going to tell you this now. Uh, I have a spoiler alert. I actually know Russell, the other person in this podcast. Yeah. Uh, here's the picture I have of, of him and I. Him and I met. It's a crazy story. Um, and I'm gonna give the, I'm gonna give you in the audience the background on this. This is fascinating. So Russell is a pastor uh, of a church called Pursuit Northwest in um, in in the in the Washington State Seattle area. I first discovered him when he went semi-viral back when COVID was a thing for essentially saying, we're not going to shut down anymore. And they did this whole trailer thing and it just was kind of very culture war -y. So I called it out and then he did a, a sermon calling deconstruction demonic. I called that out and then he blocked me. He blocked me. Now I'm like, oh, of course he did. Of course he blocked me. Now, fast forward to this year. I was at Charlie Kirk. Uh, he's the founder of uh, Turning Point and also the founder of Turning Point Faith. They, they do these pastor summits now. So I went out to one in Tennessee to kind of check it out. And lo and behold, who taps me on the shoulder? It's Russell Johnson. And, you know, I got to say, it was so interesting because I thought this guy wanted nothing to do with me. I wasn't a huge fan of him. Somehow we hit it off and we hung out the entire weekend having all kinds of honest conversations. And it was really 
great. Now, Russell and I disagree strongly on things. Russell will tell you, I, I have no problem telling him that some of his views I find incredibly problematic and that I do disagree with him strongly. And he knows that we're doing this video. I text him saying, hey, heads up, man, we're going to respond to this. But I got to say, as a as a human, um, I, Russell and I have had some really interesting talks that were much more level-headed than I would have assumed. So I think that, that just goes to show you how sometimes the internet and, and, and uh, these hot takes from people can get in the way of what could be like uh, I wouldn't maybe call us like best buds or something, but definitely much more friendly than I ever expected us to be. So I just thought that was a really interesting tidbit that the guy we're critiquing, I actually kind of know. <laughs> yeah, well, that's interesting because one of the things that we're going to highlight here is that he has by far the more rational part of the conversation. <laughs> yes. Like the, the most wild ass claims are coming from uh, Driscoll. And right. uh, we've actually got one of the first things that we're going to do is go through some of the things that I actually entirely agree with. Right. Um, and I kind of wish that he would stick to uh, throughout the video um, and like, like hold to more. Yeah. Um, this is, I do think that this is a weird, so like you and I are responding to this video, but we are not the demographic that this video is aimed at. Right. right? I mean, and this is one thing we need to think about because uh, what what is this video made for? Who is it made for? What's it doing? And it's clear to me that this is aimed at like uh, conservative leaning pastors who are who are don't want to get involved in the culture wars. Yeah. And really, the purpose of it is not to convince anybody to become conservative, offer them arguments in favor of conservatism. Right. Um, it's to. Uh, motivate them to be more politically active, to go out there and push, you know, uh, pro-life, to to get more involved in politics. Like this is the thing, and so it is a little bit weird to respond to it because it's it's more like a kind of a cheering section for conservatism than it is right. like arguments for it. Right? They're just like, <laughs> yay, conservative Christianity, <laughs> and uh, and I mean, you know, that's cool. Um, I, and I don't just want to be like boo conservative Christianity, right? That's, that's no fun. I want to offer like reasons and arguments, um, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to, uh, edit the video and set it up the way that we did was to kind of lay out, okay, here are some of the best things that they say, right. Yeah. And then try and hold them to their own standard yeah. as we go on from there to say, okay, are they actually living up to. Right. what they their own ideals in uh setting this forward i i totally agree so let's go ahead and get into it again friends we we, we distilled what is a 45 minute conversation down to about 15 20 minutes and we really nothing's pulled out of context we, we just try to get to, to the heart of some of their points so all right without further ado let's get into it friends by the way we'd love to see your comments as we're going through we'd love to see your opinion um like this i see i, I can throw up comments whenever i want so if you want to comment to be in this live just let me know, throw it out there, give us your opinion, and we'll get into it. All right, Kevin, you ready? Yep. All right, here we go. All right, Pastor Mark here with my friend, Pastor Russell. Maybe um, we're going to talk a little bit about politics and should pastors and ministry leaders be politically engaged, vocal, and involved. But before that, maybe a quick introduction, 10,000-foot view, your life introduction, who you are. Okay. You All right, can, go you ahead. Can, like, okay, so... The first thing that I want to note is about the aesthetics of this, because we've got two guys that are sitting there in front of this coffee uh, table that is actually it's supposed to be like a packing container that would be on like a barge or a ship or a truck or something like that. And it, it, if you could see that little uh, kind of orange uh, patch there, it actually says that it's supposed to be like six and a half feet tall. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the other numbers, it's supposed to be like thousands of pounds and it just here are two like grown men uh sitting in front of this thing and i don't know whether they're supposed to feel like giants yeah. like this right. oh yeah yeah the dark setting as well it's are they in an airplane hangar right what is what is happening here they've got these chairs that have like the rivets in them uh leather bound um in all this i mean it's just they're, they're trying to put off a very particular vibe, right. uh, which is, I think, very kind of working class, 
very, uh, as, as Mark would say, alpha male, right? Uh, that is this, right? We're, we're into construction. We're into, right. and at the same time, you can contrast this with like the, the, the place that I saw the coffee table was like, you could get it to construct it from bed, bath, bath and beyond. Like it's right. a, right. like it's a little, right. I mean, so there is, it just strikes me that there is this kind of concern about appearance and it can be contrasted with reality um, in everything that they're doing. And I think this is going to be one of the themes as we go through is a little bit of the contrast between like appearance and reality as they go back and forth. Right. How, yeah. how much of this and this is a kind of this is an open question for me because I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know Driscoll, right? I, uh, unlike Trip Fuller, he never like threatened to punch me in the throat or whatever it was. <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, but this is a question, like how much of, how much of this is a character that Driscoll puts on and how much of this is actually him? Yeah. You know, I mean, this is a constant thing I think that we come across in our society and our media. Um, I remember that, uh, there was like um, when Stephen Colbert was doing his play on, you know, the the conservative was doing like his Bill O'Reilly. Right. Yeah. And he met with Bill O'Reilly once and Bill said, well, you know, that's a character that I do on my show. Right. And Stephen Colbert said, if you're doing a character, what the hell am I doing? You know, I mean, like, <laughs> right, right. that's that's absurd. But it but it is this this kind of uh, shell game at some points where lots of people take these people seriously as authority figures. And yet in their own minds, they're playing characters as yeah. they go through this. They're not, yeah. you know, and so it's just, just this appearance versus reality thing that I think is really fascinating. And for me, we just kind of distilled in the packing container uh, coffee table that you can see in the background that just like screaming out, we want to be alpha males, uh, yeah. which is just just fascinating to me. Maybe a quick introduction, 10,000 foot view, your life introduction, who you are, for those who don't know. Um, what people are scared of is okay. being accused of. Uh, of can we say something for a second? Sure. Um, so this, this first set of things, I think, is the uh, kind of rational things that I would agree uh, with Johnson on. And so just to highlight that before we go into it, because I think we only need to listen to this. Some of this will preach. It's really good. All right, here we go. A Christian nationalist, or you want to end freedom of religion, you don't want to have freedom of speech. No, I'm not talking about any of that. So if you talk more about the second coming of Trump than you do the second coming of Christ, you're part of the problem. If you quote more from the CDC guidelines than you do from scripture, you're part of the problem. And so I'm not talking about turning politics into an idol, but instead allowing it to be properly aligned under our allegiance and our fidelity to Christ. It is interesting how I would totally agree with that last sentence. In fact, I say it all the time, you know, that we want our allegiance to be to Jesus and that we want to make sure that we're not, you know, um, focused too much on things that maybe don't deserve all of our attention, et cetera. So, and Russell and I have talked about this, like behind the scenes, like we use the same language, even though we have very different results. Right. What, we might have to ask what that means once we get deeper into the conversation. Because exactly. Because clearly what I would mean by that appears not to be what he means by that. Right. 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 Um, yeah. So, so, uh, and so, uh, you know, I don't need to turn pulpits into Fox News roundtables. We don't need to turn pastors into Tucker Carlson talking head. Uh, you know, when people begin to use the word of God as a window to look into the life of somebody else instead of a mirror to look into the life of themselves, then the word of God becomes this weaponized chainsaw to do as much damage as possible to prove the rightness of your very narrow theological paradigm. And for okay, me, you, that? you know, the role that, is, that we have is past. Yeah, that is, that is beautiful. Mm. I just, so, uh, when people begin to use the word of God as a window to look into the life of somebody else, instead of a mirror to look into the life of themselves, the word of God becomes a weaponized chainsaw. Yeah, to right. do as much damage as possible amen and prove the rightness of your very narrow theological paradigm I, that that's brilliant i mean that's really good I, i'm I, telling you I, when I, russell and i sat down for a meal i went 
dude, I, and you know, it's funny. I did kind of ask him like, dude, who are you on the pulpit versus who I'm talking to now? Like, help me understand that. And I'm not trying to call him yeah. out as fake or anything like that. I think he is genuine. But even I was like, wait, Russell, the clips I've seen of you don't reflect who I'm talking to right now. Because to your point, that's a great, I, I've said things very similar to that in my own language, right? Like, that's great. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I just wanted to highlight because I think that is that is pr the, the best thing in this entire conversation is that that line right there. I think it's well, just great. By the way, uh, Kevin, you've got some love already. I love Dr. Kevin already. He's come prepared. I know. I'm telling you, this guy sent me a whole list, ladies and gentlemen, of every timestamp. He's the most prepared scholar I've had on the on the show yet. So <laughs> thank you for making my life easier. All right, let's keep going damage as possible to prove the rightness of your very narrow theological paradigm. And for me, you know, the role that we have as pastors is to provide the prophetic nuance, not nuance in a sense where you never take a stand on issues because you're trying to be so calculated. But what I mean is that we hold the truth of the tension and we can speak prophetically to the left hand. We can speak prophetically to the right hand. But most of all, what we do is we are calling people to complete total allegiance and fidelity to Christ. All right. What do you got for that? So it just seems to me that this, if this is what we're talking about, I'm on board, right? Right, uh, right. Yes. So so he says, like, people are afraid of Christian nationalism. I'm not talking about that, right? I'm not in favor of Christian nationalism. Um, he's talking about speaking prophetically to the right and the left. Yes, I'm I'm on board, right? Maintaining yeah. prophetic nuance. That's, that's great. I right. mean, nuance and, like, being careful in what we say and paying attention to how it, it – affects people, how it harms them, using the word of God as a mirror and not a window so that we look at ourselves instead of looking at other people, right? Um, and, and the question, uh, the thing is, um, can they maintain the standard that he's laying out here? Right. Yeah. Do they live up to their own standards as they go through? Now, we can already see. I mean, there's some things in here that I would have to quibble with. Right. Sure. I mean, he says, um, if you talk as much about the second coming of Donald Trump as you do the second coming of Jesus. And then he parallels that to if you talk as much about right. the CDC as you do about the Bible. And I'm right. like, hold on. Is the CDC the same to the left as Donald Trump is to the right? Is this <laughs> right. really? Right. Are we are we equating those things? Right. Right. And and why why does he say have to say, well, I'm not trying to make Tucker Carlson's. I mean, I think he knows that the charge is going to that he's going to be making Tucker Carlson's. Right. Right. Um, right. But at least at least throughout all this stuff, the ideal is there for what the politics is going to look at. Um, the, and the problem is. I don't think they stick to this. I don't think that he actually lives up to it, especially the word of God as window as opposed to mirror thing. Um, we're yeah. going to see that uh, there are no mirrors for the rest of this conversation. And this is part of the problem <laughs> yeah. Yeah. is are we uh, is this a bait and switch? Right. Right. Um, is this so? So is he really devoted to those ideals? Is he using them as rhetoric to try and win over pastors who like feel like they want to avoid the culture wars, but he wants to get them involved in the culture wars? Or is this something that like he he believes in? Right? He believes in this stuff, but for some reason he's unable to connect it to places where he doesn't live up to it. Hundred percent. And it. Yeah, at that point, I mean, I want to be generous with him, right? I don't want to say that he's doing a bait and switch. Uh, with Driscoll, I don't know that he even, as I say, you notice that in the, all the rational quotes, Driscoll never showed up. Uh, so, <laughs> so that's a different right. thing. Right. But with Johnson, right? I mean, this is part of the question: is it is it that you're 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 kind of putting this out there to pull these conservative pastors who don't want culture wars in? And then you're snapping the, the trap closed on them. Right. Or is this really, is this who you really are? And then you're just not, you don't realize what the rest of the rhetoric does as I you're agree. doing it. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, that's, that's a constant problem. But what I, what I want to do is I want to contrast what we've seen in these first comments, right. Against Christian nationalism, um, using the word as a, a mirror instead of a window. And then look at what, 
they do with this in their conversation and say, does this actually lead up to what they're going to do with the rhetoric once they get into it? Well, here we go, friends. Buckle up. If you have your bingo card out for drinking, now is the time to bust it out. Uh, here comes all the stuff that you don't want to hear, but you're also here to hear all that stuff as well. So here we go. Let's get into it. And so you were out in a more rural area, but now you've you know opened a campus, as you said, in the city. For those who are still in America and don't live in places like Seattle, um, what is it like to have a campus in that kind of urban area? Because what you hear a lot about is tolerance, diversity, inclusivity, everybody's welcome. So have you gotten a lot of hugs from the Rainbow Coalition in Seattle? In Seattle has been an uphill battle where you feel like you're fighting principalities and powers of darkness every day of the week and a few times on Sunday. So every time we show up on Sunday, I say, what door's broken now? What window's broken now? What person? I just want to point out that Russell is not exaggerating here because I've seen the pictures that he sent me of his church being vandalized. So I just want to point that out that this is, in his case, I can vouch and say I've seen the pictures of like his door uh, of the church being broken in or windows being shattered. I'm not sure if it's every week, but they definitely have experienced vandalism, to be fair to him. It has to be removed from mm -hmm. service, security, those types of things in the midst of it. We're seeing a ton of young men and young women come to faith, getting baptized in water, committing their lives to Christ. And so the harvest is ripe in Seattle, but it's like Paul says, you know, to the church in Corinth, he says, God has opened a door for me in Ephesus, but on the other side, wait, many adversaries. Mm -hmm. And so it has been filled with adversarial circumstance. But I feel like really for Snohomish, in many ways, that was like our lion and bear. You know, when David fights Goliath, he says, you know, I killed the lion and the bear and today I will kill you. And so I feel like planting in Snohomish, it gave us the confidence that if God hadn't failed us before, he won't fail us now. And it, it gave us this confidence to do this thing in Seattle. But, you know, the building's been vandalized. We've been protested and picketed. They've written stories about us. But every time they do, you know, you catch flack when you're over the target. And for me, especially planting a spirit-filled um, uh, you know, church uh, campus in that region, if you're not catching flack, if they're not trying to cancel you, if they're not trying to throw you into the fiery furnace, you know, you're probably not doing much of anything worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I, they, they I, are not uh, just, oh, God, you're good. I think that this is, yeah, his, his church has been uh, vandalized. There have been stories written about him. Um, but here's the thing. I don't think that any of that was over him uh, pronouncing the gospel or going out and like just just holding up for Christianity. I mean, even he has said in uh, interviews that this all started exactly as you said. It was really over COVID right. and whether the church would shut down during COVID. And it seems to me that that's that is a. Uh, a lively political issue, right? Um, but it's not at the core of the gospel whether you shut down your church during COVID or not. Mm. This is a this is a uh, a question that has goods on either side, right? I mean, the policies about shutting down church were about saving the weak and the poor in the elderly in the society from death. Right now. If you think that this issue is so cut and dry that the gospel absolutely requires you to open your church and like potentially expose people to, you know, what amounts to death, we'll have a chance to come back and talk about this a little bit more because there are more comments on COVID later on. Right. Um, but I, I do think that you have to contextualize um, what's he, what's happened in the, the pushback that he's gotten in that society, not only in terms of so they're putting it like the Rainbow Coalition and all that stuff. I think this was about people who were reacting to uh, what they saw as a church that was endangering public health. And they got pushback on that. Now, the pushback is not right. They should not be doing that. But it's a different thing than saying, oh, this is about the gospel and this is about, you know, uh, standing up for Christianity and, and kind of like being martyred almost uh, in the process. Yes. And, I, and I have to say, the other thing is what we get into here immediately is a uh, an absolute dichotomy, right? Light and dark and good and evil right. and David versus Goliath. 
Oh, David versus Goliath. And that line that he puts in there, which is, you know, uh, that Snohomish was like his, uh, the lion and the bear. And he comes, David comes to Goliath and Goliath here is Seattle. Right. Right. And, uh, and he comes to Goliath and he says, I've killed the lion and the bear and I'm here to kill you. Right. Well, I mean, think about being a minister who opened his church during COVID and then using that as the metaphor right. for what you're doing right. in uh, in your ministry at that point. I mean, right. that's, do, do you not, how do you not realize what the rhetoric is and how that sounds coming off to other people? Right. Right. I mean, and in some ways, if you're using the word of God as a mirror rather than a window to look at other people, shouldn't you open that up on yourself and say, oh, man, maybe that's not a good metaphor for what I've been doing. Or as he says, right, when you're over the target, you take flack. Right. Well, that's like a that's a World War Two metaphor. You're dropping bombs on people at that right. point. Right. right. Uh, right. And, the, and the name for this whole video is like war plan. Right. right? I, and at some point I know that. So Christianity and this is this is one of the differences between uh, me and I, either one of these guys, because these guys will portray Christianity as like one monolithic thing that agrees with them. Right. Um, and Christianity, of course, is a massive, complicated, contradictory <laughs> right. tradition. A lot of streams part. flowing out of that river. Yeah. And there are these kind of apocalyptic streams that get into light and dark and fighting against principalities and powers. I fall more on the side of Christianity that says, you know what? That makes it sound like uh, we're not really monotheists. Right. That makes it sound like we don't believe that God is really in control of the world. We don't believe that. The, you know, we believe that the devil has some power independent of God and that we have to fight it out on God's behalf right. against these powers of evil. And, you know, so for me, it's like that, that just that doesn't match with the kind of Christianity that I practice. I recognize that they come from different traditions of Christianity, but it's a very it's a very different language and it's yeah. a very different kind of Christianity that you get into at that point. The only thing um, I want to add really quick, yeah. uh, because we do have to, I want to make sure we get all these clips in for sure. It's just that it yeah. is interesting to me that, um, you know, and this is like a common thread I hear from people like Mark or like people like Russell, you know, they'll use this language that we're under attack, but we're going to persevere, but they live very cozy lives. They're worth usually a good amount of money. They're in the public light. I mean, you know, Mark Driscoll was praying over, uh, what's her name? Carrie Lake, uh, the, the, the person who ran for governor in Arizona. Russell was recently featured on an account called Profits and Watches because of how expensive his watch is. Now, I'm not saying that that because you have wealth, you don't have stress or that people, you know, maybe uh, people's words don't get underneath your skin. But this perception of like, wow, woe is me in poor America as a Christian, like life is just so tough here. Yeah. I do find like it doesn't match usually the uh, the actual lived lifestyle or financial security or even clout or platform that they have. Uh, so I just think it's very interesting to um, to observe that for sure as we kind of get yeah. more into this. And one other thing, just when uh, when Driscoll started off there and say uh, for, you know, do you live in uh, America or in Seattle, giving you mm. the options between those two? Yeah. Like this is, again, early on, what I liked about it was he said no Christian nationalism. Right. But it's immediately as soon as we get into Driscoll, he's like, who are the real Americans? Right. Where, well, what we're talking about are clearly these rural Christian, you right. know, and it's just like that's you're right back into Christian nationalism. As soon as you've done that. hundred percent. Not, not to right mention into, Mark started his first church in Seattle. So all of a sudden he yeah. goes from what? Loving Seattle, trying to rescue it to, oh, well, Seattle is garbage. It's like, again, and, and we're really off a little off topic here. We'll get back into it now, friends. But just a final thought and then we'll get back to the video. I have I believe that Mark is someone who really adapts to the, his surroundings to continue the work that he does. He's, he is a good communicator. He speaks really well. And if you don't know much, he's convincing. But he's reinvented himself so many times uh, from he he started in the in the neo, you know, the, the neo Calvinism movement went emerging for a bit, went back to Calvinism, then went non-denominational. Now he's in the charismatic space. So like he's just hard to pin down as far as like, well, what are your actual convictions anyway uh, for a different mm -hmm. discussion? All right, let's get back into this. 
gospel as it pertains to the gospel. So this is where the cult, this is where the culture has shifted. It used to be, I think Christianity is wrong, but now there are some that would say Christianity is immoral. 100%. And if it's wrong, you ignore it or mock it. If it's immoral, you have to oppose and stop it. Yes. And so that's what we're seeing now is Christ, Christianity, and biblical belief. It's, uh, <laughs> it's something that is evil and needs to be stopped. And so, you know, when the Bible talks about what are those who call evil good, good evil, light, darkness, darkness, light, that's exactly what it is. It's like, I, you know, my, my, my issue with, with, with Mark on this is just how, again, he's a great wordsmith, right? He strings things together. You're like, oh, how do you unpack all of these layers? It, 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 it continues to blow me away, though, how Mark really thinks that in America, where there are over a quarter of a million churches, where he has become probably a millionaire, where he has almost 400,000 followers, where he gets asked to speak at massive platforms, you know, uh, that somehow like he's really under threat here. Now, certainly there are people who strongly dissent, and it makes sense when you hear him talk about how queer people are demonic. Yes, Mark, that is problematic. But again, because he, has, he, because he equates his version of Christianity with true Christianity or the Bible, you yep. the, the average Joe just assumes one of the same. The average Joe assumes that Mark's just reading wherever in the Bible and coming away with, with these ideologies. Therefore, to go against Mark is to go against the Bible, which is so deceptive, but it's very effective. Yeah, no, this is one of the things that on my TikTok uh, channel, I've done a couple of critiques and some of the people responding uh, often claim that evangelical or conservative evangelicalism has a persecution kink that they're like, uh, they, they really like to be persecuted and they like to think that they're persecuted. Like they really enjoy it. Right, um, right. And this is, I mean, we're in a country where uh, even though the numbers are going down, it's still like 63% of Americans think of themselves as Christian. If you look at the way that our society is structured, I mean, it's not a mistake that we get off a huge section of time from schools around Christmas. Like this is not, right. I mean, if you're Muslim, you're not getting all of your major holidays off from work automatically. Like the society is not structured around those things. Right. And for some reason, right. He's now I, I do understand because of exactly what you said. I mean, like he talks about biblical Christianity and by that he means my Christianity, right? Totally. The, the kind of Christianity that I am preaching. And honestly, I'm kind of sympathetic if people think that parts of that Christianity have moral problems, right? I don't think that that's true of Christianity as a whole, but of, of particular kinds of Christianity. And if we're using the word of God as a mirror, and we're Christians, right. we should recognize that some kinds of some parts of Christianity have moral problems, right? right? I mean, that's one of the things that we're that we should be doing. Um, okay, well, we can go ahead with this uh, this clip and follow it out a little bit further. Really quick, I want to bring this up. Arthur's been in our comments, and he made a comment earlier saying that Christianity is not contradictory, and then he asked, uh, he needs a, he needs to hear a specific example of something supposedly contradictory. This conversation between me and Kevin responding to Mark and Russell is an example of a contradiction, how we hear the same yeah. things with very different results. And this is one small example out of 2000 years of church history. So there's one practical example for you. All right. Yeah, no, I mean, okay, there, there's Catholics, there's Mennonites, there's <laughs> right. Baptists, there's right. Wesleyans, there's right. And and here I also I mean, yeah, I, I think the Bible itself is contradictory, but I'm also talking about the whole of the Christian tradition. You know, how do you read the Bible? And there's so many contradictions in there on just about every point of theology. Christians are at some point going to disagree with each other. A hundred percent. All right, here we go. It's like all the time with political candidates on stage when they get asked about their religious values, they say, well, that's my private religious belief. There is no such thing as a private religious belief. Uh, when you have a worldview that's been formed by Christ, that impacts every realm of society that you interact with. Yeah. And the reality is, is that there is no space in our world today in which Christ is not king. There's a lot of spaces that don't recognize Christ as king, but he, his authority and his dominion covers the earth. Okay. All right, Let's go ahead. Okay, so again, he started off, I'm not talking about Christian nationalism, right? And now he gets to this point where he says, well, you know, politicians, where they get up on stage and they say, well, that's my personal religious position, right? And we have to think about what do they mean by that? Right. And I think what politicians usually mean is, I believe that, but I'm not going to enforce that coercively on someone else, 
Yes. Right. Like, yes. like that's what I mean. And there are lots of positions that I have like this, right? <laughs> abortion. I, I'm not, well, obviously I'm not going to have an abortion, but like, I don't, uh, I'm not in favor of people having abortions. I think people shouldn't have abortions, but I also don't want to coercively force people into adopting my position on the issue. Right. right. And that, that has to be, if you're not in a theocracy, that has to be a position that's coherent for people to hold. Right. Like that I hold a personal, my personal conscience believes this, but I'm not going to coercively force it on anyone else. And right. that's, that's the problem. So I agree, right? Uh, uh, Christ is king. Yeah, that's that's true. But by that, I, I don't want to take out the politician's ability to say, oh, you know what? There's a difference between my personal conscience and what I want to put in law. And right. It's uh, by... uh, sorry to interrupt you, but also the sleight of hand yeah. here that I hear all the time is Christ is king. Therefore, I should be. It's like, no, no, no. Wait, you're not Christ. Like, you're not Christ. Mark Driscoll is in Christ. Donald Trump is in Christ. But for them conservative culture war values are Christ, right? So if you mm -hmm. are in favor of like queer rights, oh, the, you're disagreeing with 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 Christ being king, right? Um, and yeah. so that that's the trick. And ironically, right, if, if you really believe that, and which, by the way, I mean, I can say as a Christian, I believe that ultimately Christ is ruler over all. Um, sure, I believe that. If that's the case, I would want to start with the words that we have from Christ. Like, I don't know, the freaking Sermon on the Mount or Matthew 25, which talks about if we don't take care of the poor and, you know, clothe the naked, we're in danger of judgment. You would think that those are the verses, right, that become like this mantra from people like Russell and Mark to demand our society, um, you know, uh, cave into and to, uh, you know, write into law. But suddenly that's socialism. That's not the true God gospel this other conservative thing is so again like the, the this language so often i'm like yeah i would agree with that but the 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 working out of that is radically different and i would argue i'm just starting with the words of jesus it is harder for yeah. a rich man to enter the kingdom than, than a camel through the eye of the needle huh maybe we should, we should talk about about the rich in our society no 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 that's socialism, Tim. No, no, no. You're just greedy. That's envy. So we they always have to pivot to actually ignore so many of the words of Christ, maybe pick up on one or two of them that that that, that fit their rhetoric, and then say, oh no, but Christ is king, Christian nationalism, or whatever it is, you know, must happen in America to make this conservative value set possible. Yeah. There's so George Lindbeck, who's a great theologian, once lays out, he says, look, uh, Christ is king is both a true and a false claim. And he says, because it can be said by the Franciscan monk who's feeding the homeless person and by the crusader who's lopping off a kid's head while he says it, right? right? And he says, in one of those contexts, it's a true claim. In the other context, it's a false claim because one of them doesn't know what it means. 100%. And it's the Franciscan feeding the homeless guy who actually knows what it means for Christ to be king. And it doesn't mean that he's like coercively imposing it on someone. I love how this person said it gets problematic when it becomes Christ is king equals I follow Christ equals I have authority. I totally authority. agree with you. I think that that's a real good summation of it. So, all right, great. Let's keep mm -hmm. going. This is fun. Great job, Kevin, so far. You're killing it. <laughs> what we do need to do is infuse courage into ecclesiastical leaders to go, look, uh, just like Esther, who went before the king from the advice of Mordecai, who said, if you don't speak now, don't think that your family will be safe. They'll come for them and then they'll come for you. And the reality is, you know, uh, uh, the, the doctrine of appeasement that, you know, feeds the alligator hoping it will be eaten last has become a theological paradigm that people subscribe to and they don't even know it. It, it. it is shocking to me how we take a story of an oppressed minority group and flip it to benefit the dominant power group in America. I, 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 but go ahead, Kevin, the floor is all yours. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing is, and, and, and realize the stakes, right? I mean, right. if you don't agree with this, they're coming for you and your family. Like right. this is th that has echoes of like uh, Niemöller's uh, thing that like, oh, they came for the communists and yes. I didn't say anything because I was not a communist. Right. They came for the workers and I didn't say anything because I wasn't a worker. And of course, it's the Nazis that he's talking about there. Right. Right. And then he says 
And then the doctrine of appeasement. I mean, again, you're immediately into uh, like the beginnings of World War II and the ways that people dealt with the Nazis and that they appeased the Nazis and gave them territory instead of fighting back against it. I mean, so there is, there is, what is it, Godwin's Law or something like that, that in any argument on the internet, eventually someone will be called a Nazi. Right, um, right. And, and I mean, I don't, he doesn't, I don't think this is prophetic nuance. That's what he was talking about earlier. But this is a kind of nuanced version of Godwin's Law, where he's saying, look, if you don't agree with us, right, they're coming for your family. The danger is appeasement. Don't do this. And I, it's, it's just so absolute because if you find yourself up against Nazis, the only thing you can do is fight against them. Like there's no negotiating with Nazis. There's right. no like going back and forth with Nazis. Like, so if that's the situation we're in, we really are in a war and right. we might as well get rid of democracy. We might as well get rid of because it's just a war that we're involved in. And that's what this rhetoric pushes you to. A hundred percent. And by, you know, again, like, the, this is all with the undertone of like the culture war issues. So queer people, for example, are definitely part of this appeasement thing, no doubt in my mind about, about who they're talking about, probably liberals or whoever else it is. And what what the reality is this, right? The, the actual data is that there are have been a record amount of anti-queer and anti-trans pieces of legislation introduced to minimize their rights, whether it's it's access to health care or, 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 you know, right to service, etc. There have been no pieces of legislation introduced by queer people trying to limit the rights of Christians at all. It hasn't happened. Yeah. And so, again, like the reality is actually the inverse. The people who are in this conservative Christian nationalist world are the ones pushing for legislation that are actually harming people. Meanwhile, marginalized groups historically in America who try and get recognized for their full worth and value are then seen as the aggressor for simply trying to get access to the same rights that those in privilege have been afforded, which is what we're seeing happen yeah right now right this is that, that that's yeah. exactly what that is and so by if by appeasement you mean queer people have a right to exist and they can be represented in media and you know they can get married and, and recognize you know uh, as a legal marriage in states yeah yes that's called a human right and again you don't have to you don't have to accept it you don't have to believe anything no one's forcing you to do that but mm -hmm. these people do exist and they have a right to exist in america so i'm i'm with you all the way it's just it, again it just it blows my mind when you look at the actual data points to see how people who are claiming so often persecution are oftentimes the ones doing the persecuting um anyway mm -hmm. i'll stop ranting now but this stuff just yeah. it gets me all fired up so <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Here Why we go. I got involved in the public policy space to begin with was because I had a conviction on the great moral issues in the political world, the issues of life, family, and marriage. So for me, when Roe v. Wade got overturned, I was like, we got to celebrate this thing. We've got to rally behind this. This is incredible. This is the result of decades of prayer and of work behind the scenes to bring us to this moment. And look, we don't have to turn Sunday morning into everybody's got to vote this way on the bond issue and here's what the property taxes are doing, but on the great moral questions of our day. We, if we murder, don't have the courage to speak. Are we going to gonna murder babies? Right. Are they going to indoctrinate our children into mental illness, which is gender dysphoria? Hold me back. If our child is confused, mm -hmm. is the state going to seize and mutilate them? Are they going to close our church? Are they going to force us to marry two dudes? I mean, it's, it's at the point now where we're not even talking about political issues. We're talking about family and faith and freedom. Right. If you read the storyline of the um, I just want to say, I'll let, I'll give you, I'll give you the microphone because I'm sure you have a lot to say. Mark consistently peddles in falsehoods. Um, are they going to force us to marry two, two dudes? Uh, the answer to that is no, there's no legislation anywhere in sight of forcing churches to do things that they don't want to do. That would be called, that is religious freedom, right? Okay. You have a right to, to say what you want and to do what you want. Just leave us alone. And also he always peddles in this idea of, uh, that, that the government is taking away children to make them trans. That is of also complete bullshit. Like I've covered this on previous things with Mark. Mark is referring to pieces of 
legislation. One of them actually got shut down uh, in California that would allow judges to consider a child's uh, gender identity among a range of other issues in a custody battle, right? So if two mm -hmm. parents are fighting over their kids and one is affirming of their gender and one is not, that could be a factor in, in where the kid goes for custody uh, when it comes to having custody. Another example, I think actually was in Washington State, was that um, if an unhoused youth is taken in, uh, the government first has to try and reunify with their parents at all costs, but also is able to help that person find health care if they are experiencing, you know, uh, a, a, a separation between their biological sex and gender. But that gets twisted to the government wants to take your kids and make them trans, but that's not what's actually happening. So again, like Mark Driscoll is such a bullshitter. He's such a snake oil salesman in this case, but his audience just takes it because it fits the narrative that they hear from Matt Walsh, from Charlie Kirk, from this far right media empire. And that's what makes it so absolutely problematic. Yeah, no, I mean, this is he talks about like uh, they're going to indoctrinate our church, our children into mental illness, which is just I mean, no, what what people want to do is allow people to know about other people's identities. Right. right. Nobody right. there's there's nobody. I I'm the father of a trans kid. Right. And mm. I I see my kid get bullied at school. I would not wish this on somebody. I'm not going to indoctrinate somebody into it, right? I don't even, I love my child. I will affirm my child, uh, but I don't even really want it for them because they have to suffer through the mm. things that they have to go through. The yeah. idea that people on the left are trying to indoctrinate people into gender dysphoria is just delusional. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I, the only thing that you can mean is we want books in libraries that reflect different lifestyles, right? Right, right. And, uh, and I live in a state where it's, it's exactly the opposite, right? In Missouri, um, it's illegal to get gender affirming care. I mean, that's because Republicans have come through and they've gotten rid of that possibility. So it's the danger is not taking kids away and mutilating them. It's we're not even letting people make choices about their own bodies right. in the United States. Right. I mean, that that's just. Ah, oh, yeah. So anyway, well, it, it also um, takes away your parental rights, right? I mean, the, this movement is built on the oh, yeah. idea of parental rights, but unless they're for you and your trans child, then you actually have no rights and you just have to deal with it because, you know, gender mutilation, which again is a complete straw man and not even true, especially when it comes to kids. Like it is in, I, the only I know of like I've heard of maybe two cases, period, where someone who was 16 got a double mastectomy. That's what the, the level we're talking about. No one under that age is getting top or bottom surgery because doctors don't want to do harm. They want to make sure that they handle this responsibly and ethically and parents want the best for their kids, right? So again, like there's so much rhetoric, so much propaganda, so much just one-liners that have been, I believe, manufactured by a, a larger, you know, just network of people to try and maintain the status quo and it takes away the rights of parents who have trans kids who are looking for help who are looking for ways to make their their child uh flourish in the best way possible but because of their rhetoric and because of their laws your rights are now diminished mm -hmm. um now i also want to go back to uh what uh the, the guy said to start out with the great political issues that he was interested uh, yes, in which were yes. life family and marriage. Now yep. we've seen them claim that they're concerned about biblical Christianity, right? And yes. I want to know where it is in the Bible that they're finding that abortion, family, and marriage are the top moral issues. I mean, <sighs> you know how many times abortion is mentioned in the Bible? Like there's a big fat egg uh, there is there is no mention directly of abortion any place in the Bible. Mm. The closest that it comes is in the Levitical laws when it discusses the fact that if a woman gets hit and ends up miscarrying, right, uh, what's the remuneration involved in the miscarriage that happens? That's as close as you get in the Bible to that discussion. So why does that? The idea that family have you have you read the New Testament at all? Like Jesus's comments on family are very rarely positive, right? I mean, he says, uh, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his father and mother, wife and children, <laughs> pro brothers, family, sisters, pro family, his own life, 
<laughs> that person cannot be my disciple mm. like that. Was, and we move from that to family being the primary moral issue. Right. He right. tells the guy who comes and wants to bury his father. He says, no, let the dead bury their dead. Now, mm. I I am. I am I'm more pro family than Jesus was at that moment, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to be uh, heard to be like anti-family, but this this is not something that you get by reading the New Testament and then moving out, right? Um, and then marriage, as you mentioned this before, like the Bible has so many different models of marriage. Like I, what was it? Solomon had like 500 wives, 500 concubines. I don't know how the guy had so much time, right. but this is, I, I mean, you've got, you've got patriarchs that have multiple wives and servants and right. You, you have Levitical marriage where you're supposed to marry the widow of your uh, brother if he hasn't had a baby. And then if you have a baby, it's his baby. I, this is all over the Bible. Where, where are you getting this? And I think the answer to that is it comes from the politics side of things, yeah. not from the, the Christian side of things. Right. Yeah. Um, so Randall Balmer, uh, who is a great scholar of uh, evangelicalism, has a really cool thing. You can look it up uh, on uh, the Internet. It's available. It's called The Real Origins of the Religious Right. Hmm. And it highlights how uh, when fundamentalists came out of their kind of seclusion because they'd yep. been like, like separated from society in the 1920s, uh, they came back out. And what really ticked them off was uh, the end of segregation. They, totally. they really liked segregation and they wanted to come out and push for segregation. And they realized that they were going to lose that political battle. Yes. And they found that they needed other wedge issues to use if they were going to remain a political power in American politics. And let me tell you what happened out of that was like uh, life family and marriage because they fixated on those wedge issues in American politics, not coming from the Christianity side of things, but yep. looking at what were issues that they could push in politics to continue to have the power that they wanted in society. So yeah. I just uh, go and read the real origins of the religious right. It's a great piece. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it, I'm sure it talks about Jerry Falwell, how he was a segregationist. That's what got him political. Mm -hmm. It was not abortion. Abortion became a wedge issue later on, along with Paul Weyrich and why they, they, they found yep. after polling. The first they tried porn, then they tried this, they tried that. It failed. And then abortion was the issue. And here we go. The moral majority is born years later. So right. No, back, right. back then they tried all the sin issues. They tried like lottery and <laughs> right, like right. all this stuff. And, and people were like, no, we kind of like that. That's right. Uh, we'll right. do that stuff. So, yeah. yeah, no, it's fascinating history. Here we go. Bible. It's almost always God versus government. That's in Egypt. <laughs> Um, that's in the days of Nehemiah. That's in the days of Daniel. And I'm Babylon sorry. I'm sorry. Empire. It's always God versus government. What is he talking about? Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, is it you give know. to Caesar? What is Caesar? Like, okay. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. yeah. Jeez. Yeah. I, I, it's, that's it's one of those lines that, reading. well, you, you hear it and you go, oh, that makes sense. But again, once you interrogate, it's like, wait, no, it doesn't. Like, it's not, that's no, not it, at all what's happening in the Bible at all. Right. Have you? Have you ever heard of King David? I don't think that <laughs> that was like the kingship of Israel was kind of a big thing for a while. Uh, right. I don't know right, if you've noticed geez. that. But anyway. Yeah. All right. First, um, that's for sure the case with Jesus. He is executed by the state. Right. That's with Paul. He is arrested and beheaded by the state. I mean, sure. The yeah. government is usually not a fan. I mean, that's in the days of Elijah with Ahab and Jezebel. So at the end of the day, what you're seeing is. You're seeing the government seeking to do what the government has always sought to do, and that's to be anti-Christ, which is to replace Christ, yes, to remove Christ, and to replace Christ. And, and so, so for you though, I mean, even practically on the local side, we were talking about this a little bit. Some people don't understand, but like, even government is trying to find a way to get rid of church. Like, I've got a <laughs> buddy in New York, and you know, COVID hit, and if you rent a building, you're dead man walking. You can't meet anywhere. Right. And now they've got the, you know. They've got all the immigrants. And so what they're doing- They've got all example, the immigrants. York, they are, <laughs> they are paying churches to house migrants, which means they can no longer be open for worship, which means the government has effectively taken <laughs> over 
and closed the churches forever. Yeah. Okay, okay, it's fact check time because again, like I, I mean, Mark, Mark could sell me a rock. That man is such yeah. a good communicator. He's so good. But unfortunately for him, he's full of bullshit. And there's no other way, there's no other word I have because here's the article hundreds of asylum seekers to stay at 50 houses of worship in New York City. And here's a quote Pastor Gil Monroe from the Mayor's Office of Faith Based Partnerships. Wow, what a, what a hostile government uh, to the church. They have a whole office from the Mayor of Faith Based Partnerships said that while some call it a crisis, we call it an opportunity. Um, and then goes on to say, um, I'm thrilled that the city is providing this opportunity and there'll be more people filling the gap, more beds, more homes for folks. At the same time, I, I don't want the pressure to be off the city for one instant to find more permanent solutions. So again, the, the, the churches, first off, the churches are not getting shut down. They have about 19 asylum seekers that, that, that they're housing. The government is paying them again, a real hostile government here is paying them money and the clergy that were interviewed in this article seem incredibly thrilled and might i also add are actually living out what mark might call is biblical christianity i mean there are claims yeah. all over both the hebrew bible and the new testament to take care of the orphan the widow and the immigrant if this is not a straight up example of that i don't know what is yet for mark this becomes a piece of rhetoric to say oh and that terrible government they're they're just shutting down churches by forcing forcing churches to to hold uh, hold asylum seekers and it's like that again that's not the story mark like do you google anything do you read anything it's just not true Right. And it seems like one of those things where he must have picked up. This is a story that has government and immigrants in the same story. <laughs> that will sound frightening to a group of people that I want right. to talk to. Right. Like anything that has those words in it, that's definitely where I need to go. Yeah. No, I mean, this is one of those things. Like, So as you point out, this the, the idea that the Bible is consistently anti-government is just you have to entirely pick and choose and pull out of context a whole bunch of particular stories in order to get that. You have to ignore the wisdom literature. You have to ignore Romans 13. You have to ignore, right? And right. it doesn't even match. It doesn't even match with his own philosophy, right? He wants the government to come in and restrict abortion rights. He right. wants the government to come in, right? So he's not, he's not actually this. And the, the question then becomes why? Why is why does this rhetoric exist? And there's a historical reason for it, and it goes back to Ronald Reagan. I mean, that's because when Ronald Reagan was president, he put together the libertarian wing of the Republican Party and the religious right. And those two sides could never entirely agree with each other. So they made a compromise, which was like, okay, here's the deal. Um, religious right we will not uh, will not say anything about you trying to restrict abortion and these types of things. And you let us, the libertarians, run the economy where we right. won't help anybody. We'll just go forward with this. And that's where this comes from. That's where this rhetoric comes from. Again, talking about biblical Christianity, but producing something that is clearly a product of right wing Republican uh, history that comes out of it. And I just I, it's it's. It's boggling uh, how how you have to take history, how you have to take the Bible and how you have to take contemporary things that are going on and twist them in order to get them into this narrative. Right. I, I'm let's just keep going. It only gets worse, friends. Yep. I, if you're drinking, prepare yourself. Here we go. Ourselves in this kind of odd cultural moment where, you know, the way that you prove your value to the secular system is by protesting all of the things that culture tells you exist as these kind of structural systemic evils. And of course, Christendom is at the top of that list. No, no, no. Christian nationalism is a part of that list, not Christendom. I mean, I guess you could call it Christendom, but the I'll put it this way. And I would tell Russell this to his face. If, if Christians were known for pushing for affordable health care for trying to build social safety nets for the single mom trying to build livable wages so that way mom can stay home with the kids if she wants to instead of being forced to work a job alongside hubby or whatever it is right if, i'm just saying if christians were known for those ethics if they were known for hey yeah maybe we have theological convictions but we recognize that in a free society people who are different than us have a right to exist and to flourish and to have the same equal protection under the law 
you would not have these issues. You wouldn't be, uh, you know, in his words, have a target on him. But because the part, the system that Russell is a part of and what he advocates for is part of a bigger system to actually force legislation through that minimizes the rights of those people. And that, frankly, is largely, not completely, Democrats have their own problems, but largely responsible for keeping us in a dystopian hellscape where we can't find livable wages, where health care is out of control, and they don't want to fix it. Of, of course. Of course people are angry about that because we see who's in power. I mean, case in point is the newest House Speaker, Mike Johnson. This guy was part of the Alliance Defending Freedom Organization, an organization that overturned Roe v. Wade, that has said they want to overturn Obergefell at some point. Like, it's clear what conservative Christians are trying to do. And Newsflash, it doesn't have much to do at all with taking care of the least among these. It has everything to do with maintaining their power and control in the name of their very, very, very white, AR-15 loving, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, Jesus. I mean, it's antichrist in nature, and somehow they convinced million of us that this is the only Christian way to live in America. It's absolute garbage, in my opinion. Yeah, oh, I, I want to know. So, so we quoted him earlier, and in his own words, right? Christian nationalism. I'm not talking about that. I'm not advocating Christian nationalism. I would love to hear his distinction between Christian nationalism and Christian dumb. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. those sound very much like the same thing to me. And uh, if it is the case that people think that Christian dumb is evil and Christian nationalism is evil, does he disagree with them? I mean, right. is he which side yeah. of this does he actually fall on? And that takes us back to that original question. You know, were these real ideals that you're talking about or were you just putting them forward in order to kind of bait and switch people as yeah. they went? Good point. And we live in this very activist oriented generation that is looking for a cause that is bigger than themselves to give them some sense of altruistic, esoteric value. Sounds like my Christian upbringing. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying like, Russell, it sounds like that sounds like all my altar calls as a youth child, like be part of something bigger than yourself as God calling you to the mission field. God wants you to be a force to be right. I mean, this is, again, like, sure, we live in an activist culture and Christianity is a, is, is a heartbeat for so many of that activist culture. I just thought that well, was ironic. And realize and realize that they're arguing for conservatives to be more activist. I mean, right. that is what they're doing. But when they use activist here, what they clearly mean are the liberals. Like yeah. that's the, the because they get labeled as activists as opposed to these conservatives who are like just being biblical Christians. Yeah. yeah. When did altruism become a bad word in Christianity? Like how did that happen? Like care for the other is literally right. what that word means. And the alternative is egoism. I just right. don't. Okay. I'm with you all the way. All right, here we go. We'll keep going. There, I mean, as far as if Romans 1 is to be believed and they worshiped and serve creation rather than creator, every environmental <laughs> activist, every Green New Deal, every <sighs> climate saver is profoundly, deeply religious and committed to their cause. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean... Jeez, you know, you would think you would think for people that take Genesis one and two so seriously when it comes to marriage, right? Like they literally take those two different stories, by the way, and use them as the archetype for how all human marriage should be because it was God ordained, you know, and, and it was set up since creation. You would think that the whole part about stewarding the earth, you know, and taking care of it would be an equally uh, an, an equally important task because I don't know, it's baked into the creation story that humans have an obligation, right, to steward the earth well instead of dump on it and pollute it. But for Mark, because of his, of his, you know, um, political paradigm, oh, I got a little thumbs up there. That was interesting. I don't know how that <laughs> happened. <laughs> but because of, like, of like his political paradigm, that goes out the window. The idea of taking care of the planet or, and he would say, no, no, no. I believe in taking care of the planet, just not this like globalist, you know, global warming agenda, which is exactly the point, right? Like, like you obviously have to concede that we're called to take care of the planet. It just can't look like the people who actually are trying to take care of the planet and who are saying, listen, we're studying the data. The planet is warming. It's going to cause, it's causing problems and will only cause more problems. And also might I add to this, I'm sorry to go on a rant here, but so many of those climate scientists are Christian. Catherine Hayhoe mm -hmm. is a devoted Christian. I've had her on the show. She's a leading climate scientist. And she's like, we have such 
such a problem here. So again, Mark Mark's Christianity is so freaking narrow, right? It is so you know, it's so thin that even other Christians who are doing the work of trying to protect the climate, who are trying to, which, by the way, affects human flourishing, which affects humanity, uh, for him, they're just part of the culture war. They're just left-wing woke joke is what he calls them, Marxist. So again, Mark, his theology is, is truly, it's an it's an inch wide and an inch deep. It's the worst of both worlds, in my opinion. Yeah, and uh, he cites like Romans one in order to make th- that's not even what Romans one says. I mean, Romans one doesn't even t- it doesn't talk about nature. What it says is that people worshipped and served the creature instead of the creator, and th- that's in uh, one twenty five. If you go back to one twenty three, it explains what that means. It says they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. It's talking about worshiping statues. It's not ta- It's not right. even about like trading off the nature for the creator. He has to entirely make that up and shoehorn it into Romans 1 because it's not there to start with. Yeah. yeah the Bible just, is clear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Bible is clear. Here we go. Right. The funerary of like our pagan governor Again, like in California, it's like, hey, if you come into the church, you, well, you shouldn't come into the church and you shouldn't sing, but you can go out into the street and you can scream and protest. Right. It's like, why is it that people who hate God can assemble and verbalize, but people who love God can't? Right. Esoteric value. Uh, and so you you're right. Stop it yeah. right there. Go ahead. Uh, I just, the the idea, so we're talking about uh, BLM here, right? I mean, yes, we're talking Black about Matter. Black Lives mm-hmm. Matter. We're talking about protests of police abuse. Do you know anybody who loves Jesus more than black people in the United States? Like right. they are uh, much closer to the church than your general white person. Um, they have kept the tradition of sermons and oratory alive. You're talking about, it's so strange for him then to contrast. There are those people who are out there protesting, right? And they're the people who hate God. What? How did you get there? How did you, I mean, this is, it's just boggles my mind. Um, and then, of course, everybody who's uh, opening their churches despite COVID, those are all the people that love God. Right. And again, it, it's just it doesn't make any sense to just uh, it's like random association uh, totally. to do this if it weren't for the political background that is clearly driving everything in his theology. I agree. All right. We'll keep it going, friends. Friends, you hanging in there? Are you hanging in there? You right there. I see you. Are you hanging in? I hope you are. We're getting through this piece by piece. Okay, this is why we bring on a scholar. So it's just not just me ranting into the into the ether. Uh, but thanks for being here. Thanks for enjoying it. Hey, if you like this episode so far, please like it. Please subscribe. I'll have this out once this live is done. It'll be on YouTube. And I'll make sure that I put it on podcast probably next week. But I love having an audience. It's fun doing this with you. The comments and knowing that folks are tuning in live make this for me. I know that they make it for Kevin as well. So thanks for being here. All right, let's keep it going esoteric value and so you're right we we have as a society we have developed a value statement around opposing biblical ideas values and principles and so nothing is more shocking than somebody who unapologetically heralds the gospel and says no we just believe what the text says and we're not going <laughs> to apologize for it or try to hedge our bets by you know softening or reducing the gospel to fit within the framework of therapeutic deism we're just we're not going to do that we're going to be unapologetic about what the scriptures teach you know but for me over this last season, what I feel like God has done in the church is he's really separated the sheep and the goats. I mean, this has been a season this of is, separation. So this is a pruning season in evangelicalism. Yes. I mean, I, I, I agree with Mark on that last part. Like, it, it definitely is a pruning season for sure. I mean, unfortunately for him, evangelicalism is shrinking and people are leaving the church in droves. One thing I want to mention, and I'll hand it back to you, and this is a very common thing I hear. Again, I, I am speaking a little generically here, and I told Russell this. This is no secret if Russell's watching. I've said often, like, whenever I hear people say, you know, we're just reading the text, 
which parts and listen i fully acknowledge that everyone has to negotiate the text i get that i pick and choose parts i think are prescriptive versus descriptive i try and do it within a larger tradition but the point is like i'm willing to acknowledge like yes i'm still eating shellfish yes i see that in the text i see it looks like a commandment no i'm not going to listen to it right for people, maybe like Russell who said it, but in others like him, they just claimed, oh, I'm just reading the text plainly, but they're ignoring so much of it. They're ignoring all the parts that would sound even close to social justice -y. For example, James 5, right? James 5 is a brutal condemnation of the rich business owner who withholds fair wages from their workers. I mean, if it's not a critique of capitalism, I don't know what is, right? And he says like, woe to you. Judgment is coming because you store up riches for yourself. This is James 5. I have never in 35 years of being on this earth, 32 of them being in evangelical circles as deep as you can get, have never heard a sermon on James 5. And if I did, which I don't think I have, it definitely wasn't applied to Amazon and to capitalism and why as Christians, we have to fight like hell to destroy the evil Leviathan of capitalism to ensure fair wages because the Bible is clear. I've never heard that. What happens instead is that text gets translated to, oh, that's a personal decision. No, no, we can't regulate that. We can't, mm -hmm. hey, a business, I, maybe I disagree with, with, with Bezos, but the government can't interfere. But of course, when it comes to trans rights or it comes to abortion or some other culture war issue, suddenly that's a corporate command that Christians have an mm -hmm. obligation to now make laws to make everyone else follow them, regardless of, of, of what that person wants in their life to happen or not. You know what I mean? It, it, it's crazy. Yeah, no, I and that goes back to exactly that same uh, compromise between the libertarian wing of the Republican Party and the religious right when they were put together under Reagan. You know, it is this thing that, oh, when we come to economics, we're going to be libertarians. And right. when we come to social issues, we're going to be religious right. And yeah, I mean, and it turns out that the religious right adopts that as their own theology as you know they adopt the political standpoint instead of actually going off of their own best text i think that it's it's what's really notable here is uh so what he says is it's really separated the sheep and the goats and what strikes me is if you're if you're reading the bible plainly surely you know what the context of that statement is because that's the judgment of the nations in matthew 25 and the nations are judged on the basis of how they took care of the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the imprisoned. Now, you remember when he went through his biggest moral issues, did any of those come up in his biggest moral issues? Right. But here he's using it as if because what he wants to do with it is use it for that apocalyptic imagery of separating good and and evil and yeah. he doesn't want to pay attention to the actual content of it because it doesn't agree with the actual social position that he's articulating it doesn't say i'm dividing people on the basis of who rejects lgbtq plus people right, right. it says who's taking care of the poor and the oppressed he he earlier said, well, it's these activists that are all concerned about structural injustice. Well, you know what? Caring for the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the imprisoned, that requires taking on structural injustice. So maybe instead of casting that out as one of this evil activist leftist things, right? If you're taking seriously the separation of the sheep and the goats, maybe you should look into that as an issue that you should be applying yourself towards instead of picking out the things that you're picking out. You, you preach, preach it. Are you going to yeah. let God or government dictate the future of your church, BLM <laughs> and the avalanche of social justice activism led by cultural Marxists and <laughs> lesbians who created a Ponzi yeah. scheme Jesus. and called it justice, which right. is oh amazing. God. It was just a real estate grab by a couple of lesbians. I mean, I, I, the, 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 de, the dehumanization from Mark, right? Again, this is someone yeah. saying, hey, not only am I claiming to be a follower of Jesus, I'm also claiming to be a spiritual authority on the Christian tradition. I'm speaking as someone who has 
enough of an influence and knowledge to say, this is how Jesus would live his life. This is what Jesus would say. And then he goes and just completely dehumanizes two people. I'm not even, and it just really boils their identity down to sexual orientation and a very negative connotation to then cast, you know, shame on the organization that, that they started. And somehow that's the way of Jesus. Like, oh, thanks, Mark. I'm really attracted to your gospel. Like, keep going. No, that, and again, he's just picking out as many trigger words as he can. Social justice activism, cultural Marxism, lesbians, right. and BLM all in one sentence. And, you know, he's got a figure. Oh, I'm triggering people out there because what I want to do is use words that are going to motivate them to become politically active. This just goes right, right back to like Karl Rove and the meat to the, the base of the Republican Party strategy yeah. where like – it used to be in politics, the assumption was that you win by playing to the middle because you can win some of the middle over that might have been in favor of the other guy. And right. then politics took a bad turn, in part under Bush, when Karl Rove said, you know what? No, no, no. Don't worry about winning over the, the middle. Worry about motivating your own side. Yeah. And so instead of trying to moderate your position, make yourself more radical. Right. Yeah. And trigger yeah. as many people as possible. And this is the way that you win elections. And you can see this strategy working itself out in his way of talking. And you're exactly right. I mean, like, who cares? They're black people. And they were they found Black Lives Matter to be important. Who cares whether they're lesbians or not? Right. And to, to transform their concern about police violence to black people and reduce that down to their sexual orientation and just pretend that it was a power grab because of their sexual orientation, it's just disingenuous. I mean, it is, it's abusive of the truth. And if you're going to be a follower of the God who is truth, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. You ought to tell the truth when you go yeah. about this stuff. Yep. Yeah. I'm just, also, I mean, Kevin, you might know the answer to this. I'm under the impression that even the phrase cultural Marxism has its roots in some pretty anti-Semitic tropes. Now, I'm, I don't want to, I'm not saying that Mark is even aware of that. I'm going to give him a benefit, benefit of the doubt here. I don't think he is using that term in that way, but its roots do go back to anti-Semitism. Is that correct? I, you know, I just think it's a completely incoherent term. Mm, yeah. I think it is just a set of ideas that are placed together in order to trigger people on the right. It has nothing to do with Marxism. I right. mean, if you're familiar with Marxism, like uh, Marxism, the idea, first of all, Marx uh, was against thinking about race. He wanted to think about like workers and the bourgeoisie. And he thought that people who talked about race were actually distracting from the conflict between the upper class and the working class. And yeah. so Marx was not about race. The idea that this that BLM has something to do with Marxism is right. just it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. It is just kind of right wing people looking for language that will trigger people on their side. Yeah. Uh, and it, I, it does, that, so far as I know, it doesn't have any significant content to it. Uh, I want to I want to thank the Alden for the super chat. Thank you. That's so kind. I appreciate that. Just so you know, out there watching this, we are a nonprofit organization and we do this stuff completely paywall free because of donations like this. So thank you so much. It means the world. And I do want to comment here. Beth said this a great point. I didn't even think about it. Are lesbians called out specifically because they, by definition, are not seeking husbands slash men. I know a Mark Driscoll Cinco fan, and he seems to specifically have something against lesbians. This this is a great point, Beth, because in some of, of Mark's other videos, he goes hard after feminism and like really mocks women who don't want to get married and you know uh, you know he kind of uses the tropes about them being cat ladies and no one wants them so i think that there definitely could be a connection between what you just said so thanks so much for sharing it dealing with it here in arizona we've got a pro-death uh, attempt to get abortion into the state constitution wow and um, literally, it's abortion at any time for any reason done by anyone. I mean, literally, if this passes, your podiatrist or your personal trainer could terminate the life of your child. I mean, it's this is I mean, people in California would probably blush at this bill. Crazy. Like they're back. Right? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, hold on. Hold on there. I yeah. really wonder what's going through uh, Russell's head because his responses are so like, right interesting <laughs> and i wonder if in his head he's going like wow that's so much bullshit 
you know, right. because uh, what he what he's saying there is simply not true about the California law or about the Arizona law. Yeah, I'm trying to look I mean, it up. I don't see anything like what he's talking about. No, what he so what he's talking about there is uh, number one, it's not abortion at any time. It is uh, abortion up to a certain number of weeks uh, should be legal, and they don't say anybody can do it. They say anybody who's qualified can do it, and the state will have to show that they're not qualified. So mm. if you are a personal trainer in Arizona, you're not going to be able to do an abortion because right. the state is going to say you're not you're not qualified to do an abortion, and the state will establish that. That's in the law that that's the way it's going to go it's just the burden on the state to show that the person is not qualified to do it instead of the burden on the person to show that they are qualified mm. so th it's just it's running over a subtle and nuanced law right that we were talking about prophetic right. nuance at the beginning right. and just running and making it into oh now your podiatrist can do abortions that's just not true I right. mean, it is it is taking something that uh, that the law does very subtly and pretending that it doesn't it doesn't have any nuance to it at all. It is just an absurd law. And, you know, if that was what he was doing, yeah, I'd be against that law, too. But it's not yeah. what the law is doing. Well, um, I, I maybe this is TMI, but I before I went live today, I did text. I texted Russell. I said, "Dude, I don't know how you kept the straight face for so much of Mark's nonsense because so much of it is bullshit." And again, like I'm not trying because some people might think, "Oh, you're too friendly with Russell." But if you know the work that we do, you know we always try and build relationships to make the change that we want to see possible. So I have no problem telling people this. But like I, in my head, I'm like, "Dude, I, Russell, we've had conversations that are so much more nuanced than how people like Mark Driscoll mm -hmm. approach these things." What are you doing on his? show like i don't understand mm -hmm. you know anyway uh, and the other thing i want to mention is just to be very clear the i think the number is like 92 percent of all abortions have to happen before 15 weeks and like it's less than one percent happen in the third trimester and when that happens it's usually because something has gone incredibly wrong and it's unforeseen the the the, the crib is built the the room is ready and something goes terribly wrong so this mantra that you know Democrats just want to kill kids up to the moment of birth is again it's propaganda uh, when in reality the vast majority of abortions happening happen way before then um, and so I just this whole idea of murdering babies and we're gonna hear Mark compare this to Hamas in a few minutes here like it's such an unfair uh, comparison on so many different levels but again the rhetoric is very effective so anyway yeah I can yeah. so I am I am pretty consistently against abortion as a personal issue. Like I would never uh, want to participate in that. I think that we should have a society where we encourage people to avoid abortions, where we support people in order to allow them to have children, even when they're not in the ideal circumstances, where we provide them with opportunities for childcare, where we you know do all of these things in order to avoid abortions. Um, and as a as a kid, like I've always been political, uh, but uh, as a kid. I remember that I was I was pretty uh, against abortion. I thought there should be like strict abortion laws. Yeah, and same. I had to I learned the story of my aunt who was uh, dying of cancer and she was pregnant. And she the she and my uncle had wanted to have a baby like their entire time together. And they were so excited when she got pregnant. And there was there was not a bone in her body that did not love that whatever we want to call it, the fetus, the infant, whatever it was. She loved that that baby. Right. Um, but she was dying of cancer. And the only possibility they had of doing anything to treat the cancer would lead to the death of the fetus. And she, she, was, she was breaking down because of that. And as she was going through this, because it was before Roe v. Wade, she also had to go through a court system in order to get it justified and had to listen again and again to like testimony and talking about why it was justified in order to have a judge, you know, sign off on it, which was already this horrible trauma that she was going through. And I remember being like, that's that's not right. If mm -hmm. people are being, if people are having to go through this kind of trauma in their lives anyway, the least we can do is say, maybe the state should not be involved in this right. decision. 
right? Yeah. Um, like it wasn't even, it wasn't even, the baby was never going to live. Um, she was going to die of cancer before she got to the pregnancy anyway. And she did event, she did die of the cancer. Right. It, the, the, the treatment was not eventually successful. But that was the thing that brought me to think, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm all for I believe that, that uh, fetuses are going on to become human beings. And I don't believe in, you know, killing them under any in, under circumstances. But I also don't think the government should be inserting itself in the traumatic experiences of people who are making these life and death decisions about their own lives and the lives of their own babies. Yeah. Um, and that's that's one of those things. I just, you know, and then yeah. if you're going to if you're going to use the word murdering babies. Right. I just think of my aunt and I, I've got to say, uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing that will meet convince me that your position is evil. Right. Um, right. Because if right. you aren't able to take seriously that experience, yeah. then I, I don't think we're participating in the same discussion. I agree. Thanks for sharing that story, Kevin. Right now, they're beheading, Hamas is beheading babies. Oh, here we right? go. And everybody's yeah. mortified. And it's like, uh, we do that every day. Right. And uh, we just don't put it live stream on the internet, but you should be equally horrified. Right. So, right. I mean, for 2,000 years of okay, church Okay, hold on there. Uh, I'm here. So, so every part of that is probably false. Um, every yeah. part of that is probably false. Uh, so first, the idea that Hamas was beheading babies was, in fact, a news report that came out from an unsourced witness that nobody has been able to uh, back up or verify in any way. It made uh, headlines because it was so uh, extreme acclaim about what Hamas was doing, but they have not been able to verify or confirm, found the, the, you know, the evidence of any of this. And he says they're streaming it live on the Internet. That they're what? beheading babies. Uh, this is no, that never happened. Yeah. Um, so that so number one, that's that's not a thing that happened that even Hamas was doing. Then the idea that we should be equally horrified about abortions that are happening inside the United States. Um, so I'll, I'll say I'm again, I don't again, I'm not in favor of abortion. I also don't want to equate an embryo with a baby. Um, those are two very different things. I One of my favorite thought experiments in ethics is this question um, that I know uh, that Sandel has done at points um, in his arguments. It's this question. So if you had a, a child and an embryo, so you've got a, a Petri dish with an embryo on it, right? And you've got a child and you're in a burning building. Yep. Right. And you can save one of these two things. You've got enough time to either get out with the Petri dish with the embryo on it or the baby that's going to get burnt to death. Right. Do you have any basis for choosing between them? And how would you choose? Right. And to me, it seems if anybody saves the embryo in the Petri dish, there's something wrong with that person. Hmm. Because if you leave the baby to be burned in the building, right? The baby that you can hear crying, that is, you know, explicitly suffering there. Like this is, it seems to me that yes, there is value in an embryo. I don't doubt that, right? Sure. But do we want to say that that is equal to the value of a living viable baby? I think that, that just about everybody's moral intuitions would say, no, these two mm. things are not actually equal with each other. And even those of us who are considerate towards embryos and think that they are a form of life ought to say these things are not actually morally equivalent with each other. And mm. if we have a choice between an embryo and the life of the mother, then you know what? The life of the mother probably takes precedent in those cases. Yeah. Right. Uh, so so I just the equation of uh, beheading babies with uh, early 
uh, abortions in the process of pregnancy just it just strikes me as rhetoric that is over the top that is uh unrealistic and again primarily for political purposes not for as uh, as he said earlier right prophetic nuance right. about what we're actually arguing about in these cases Great point. Also, I want to reiterate, I know that, that this is understood for you, Kevin, and for me, but obviously you and I have already been on a podcast condemning the actions of Hamas. So we're not, what yeah. we're saying is we're not saying that Hamas uh, is is doing good stuff over there. Okay. But we, what we are no. saying is, that, and you're right, I've tried to track that story as well. At best, it's a very murky, cannot find clear evidence of that actually happening, even though it took off online as a reality. And then Mark used that along with some other definitely false, no one has has reported anywhere that Hamas was live streaming that on the internet to make a point. So I, just, I, I know that that's understood, Kevin. I'm not saying you yeah. are not doing that, but for the audience out there, someone's going to say something. So to be very yes. clear. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Here we go. Horrified. Right. So, right. I mean, for 2,000 years of church history, the body of Christ has had a rich legacy of being engaged in the public policy space. You know, whether it's William Wilberforce and, and the ending of, of slavery, uh, whether it's uh, Susan B. Anthony and and uh, some of the you know pro life movement, the, the, when you look at 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 the at the canopy of church history, the church has always been on the front lines of advocating for Christological legislation that helps the country and the world look more like the kingdom. The cold. Uh, okay, it's all you, Kevin. You're the scholar here. <laughs> yeah. So, so anybody that makes a claim that starts out with, for the 2,000 years of church history, the church has always done this, whatever comes next is almost certainly not going to be true. Mm. Um, and, and certainly, if you look at this, I mean, so the Christian church has a long history of complex relationships between, say, imperial power and ecclesial power. I mean, you got Galatius back in the third century who articulates a difference between the priestly power of Jesus and the kingly power of Jesus and says these two are not the same. And so the emperor wields the kingly power of Jesus, whereas the pope wields the priestly power of Jesus. Right. Um, you have uh, like uh, Augustine who develops the idea of the seculum, a place where like uh, both Christians and uh, pagans have to live together in the world and have mm. to find overlapping goods with each other in order to live together in the period before the second coming of Christ. You've got like Mennonites, the Amish, right, um, who clearly are not contributing to public debates about policy. They're right. withdrawing from the society, right? Um, you've got 19th century fundamentalists. I mean, these are at the roots of the traditions that these two guys are drawing on yep. who for a good 50 years withdrew from American politics and went into a kind of secluded form of living. But more than any of that, has he ever heard of the early church? Mm. I mean, the idea that the apostles, Paul, any of these guys are contributing to public policy discussions. I mean, that's no early Christians have no contribution to that. They're not in a position to have any contribution to that. Mm. I mean, Christianity starts out as a community within the wider empire and Christians don't have any power. They are not putting forward policies. They are not articulating, uh, you know, the laws that are going to be put forward. It's just strange to claim that across the 2000 years of Christian history, Christians have always been advocating for public policy. I, that just that just can't be true. Um, right. There are certainly times when Christians have, right? So that claim is just, it's oversimplified to the point of being false. Number two, have Christians always advocated policies that bring the world closer to the kingdom? <laughs> <Right>. So <laughs> when Christians yeah. have advocated policies, They've often advocated for policies that took the world much further away from the kingdom of God. I mean, I don't know if he so he cited William Wilberforce. Excellent. Right. Uh, trying to end slavery. I don't know if he knows on the other side of that debate. 
there were a whole bunch of Christians advocating for explicit racism, slavery, and doing yep. so, uh, you know, on the basis of the Bible. And the argument was pretty straightforward. You know, these are the guys that were saying, just read what the Bible says straightforwardly. Right. The Bible yes, approves yes. of slavery. It says slavery is OK. It never condemns slavery. This is almost exactly the argument that people like Driscoll will pull out against homosexuality, where they say, oh, look, you know, it condemns a particular set of things. It never approves of them. Therefore, the Bible's straightforward on this. If you read the Bible that way on slavery, you will be in favor of slavery yep. because the Bible does doesn't condemn slavery. It says it's okay in some places. And this was the straightforward evangelical argument in favor of slavery. So those people were not advocating for laws that made the world closer to the kingdom. Um, the doctrine of discovery embraced yes. by the Roman Catholic Church that said that people from Europe can go out, can colonize, can take over, can take the goods away from Native Americans and Africans and really the whole creation of race. The whole idea of race was a creation of Christians who had this problem. They had the natural law tradition before them that said that everybody who's a human has on the basis of their humanity, the ability to rule over themselves. They have from nature knowledge of the good. They have, you know, they're basically following along saying everybody's got a conscience. And so if you run into another human being, you have no justification for taking over them and oppressing them. And so the, the move had to be by a set of Christians. Oh, you know, that's true of all human beings. So, you know, a way around that we're going to treat a certain set of people as not being human beings. Right. And so there were a set of Christians who created ideas of race on the basis of trying to get around their own tradition on this stuff. Right. So the idea that uh, you know, Christians have always advocated laws that made the world closer to the kingdom. No, they have not. I mean, that's just absurd. Then the third thing that's oh, he's not done. This, I love it. No, I'm not done. The Go. third thing that's wrong with this. Look at his examples. William Wilberforce and Susan B. Anthony. These are people who are fighting structural injustices in society on behalf of like poor and oppressed communities, right? These are not the people that, say, Driscoll is aligning himself with. So if you want to use these as your positive examples from Christian history, get yourself on the same side as they were on, right? Fight on behalf of women's rights. Fight on behalf of the rights of minorities. Go out and do this because you don't get to claim these people as your examples and then fight against everything that they stood for when they were participating in politics. That is just a, a shell game that we should not allow people to get away with. So every I, part of that claim, I'm just... I, I'm I snapping have for you, man. No, I, I appreciate yeah. that. I have not, not much to add. The only thing I will add is I will just say, it always makes me feel good whenever I hear someone of your caliber say things that I have been saying as well, which is the same Christians who said the Bible is clear endorsed slavery and segregation. I mean, I literally have a Bob Jones sermon archived on my computer in his 1960 yeah. or 1954 address. Uh, is segregation you know, biblical? And he literally says it is. Here's the proof text. And anyone who, who doesn't see yeah. it this way is a liberal who doesn't take the Bible seriously. Now, most... Yeah. I, I say most because we know about Doug Wilson and his kin as friends, but the majority of evangelicals today would say, no, segregation is not biblical, racism is wrong, but they're the same people who will use the same exact structural arguments and then say, well, the Bible's clear on, quote, homosexuality, therefore, we have to do the same thing that our forefathers did to black people, now to the queer community. And so it just yeah. blows my mind that, that 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 they can't see how it's the same exact framework, just with, just with, with a different mark marginalized group in place to, again, maintain the power and then to make it a culture war issue for white evangelicals to stay 
you know, the, uh, in power. So it's very frustrating. Yeah. And and I will say, like, the, the, the lines on this are just fascinating, because if you look at the people who are uh, Christian evangelicals arguing against slavery, right, who are trying to take the Bible seriously, but find arguments against slavery, what they had to do was to say, OK, let's go back and let's read the Bible in historical context. Let's try and pick apart the differences between the slavery that we had and the slavery that there was in the Bible. Let's be really nuanced about this and let's find out why the Bible might not, in fact, under right the kinds of slavery that we have today and what that actually looks like a lot is the people who go back to the bible today and say you know those verses that appear to condemn same-sex sex I'm not sure that they condemn homosexuality because if we look at them in their historical context, what they're talking about is subtle and nuanced and slightly different, right? And uh, that was, you know, that was those were the arguments against slavery, which a lot of evangelicals at that time said, oh, no, that's not the straight reading of the Bible. Right. And now it's the same thing about homosexuality, right? You're, well, you're doing the same straight reading. That's the one that landed you on favor of slavery. That's yeah. the same one that lands you against all all forms of uh, homosexuality. Why don't we learn at some point? Right. Um, right. It would it would just be nice uh, well, to move. Like I, like I say often, the Christian faith can be used as a weapon for oppression or a tool for liberation. So to pretend that Christians have yeah. always been on the right side of history is just a fool's errand. Of course, many Christians have done amazing things. They have fought for ending slavery. They, you know, the sciences, public schools, hospitals, many contributions from faithful Christians trying to love Jesus. However, a lot of Christians in the name of that same Jesus, or at least the idea of what they think is Jesus, did Ooh. a lot of freaking damage to a lot of people. We have to recognize that. And the question we have yeah. for today is what stream are we trying to participate in, right? One that brings about the human flourishing of others and our neighbors, or one that maintains our power and control at the expense of those people? That's the million yeah, dollar question. And again, we can go back to that same metaphor. I love that metaphor that uh, that Russell used at the beginning of the thing, right? Is the word of God used as a window to look at others or a mirror to criticize yes. ourselves? And if we use the, the word of God as a, as a way to criticize ourselves, then as Christians, we have to take seriously the fact that we have not done everything that well. And yeah. so this kind of claim just wouldn't be on the table if we use the word of God in exactly the way that he suggested using it at the beginning of the video. Great point. Friends, we got three minutes left. We're almost there. Take a breather. I know <laughs> if you're Eastern time, it's getting late. If it's Pacific time, you're just getting warmed up. But hang in there. We got three minutes left. Kevin, you've been great so far. Thank you for putting the time and effort into making this video and, and you know getting your points uh, organized. It's been really helpful for so many. All right, friends, home stretch. Here we go. Cold repentance precedes the gospel then empathy would be the neutralization of repentance. Right. Because instead of saying, I understand you, I affirm you, I walk with you, you know, I, uh, I, I sympathize with you. It's like, no, no, I call you to repentance. Correct. <laughs> and, you know, Jesus. so I, I think that the cult of empathy, it, it looks like Christianity, but really what it is, it's a, it's a bunch of cowards. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an Ahab spirit of pacifism. Right, right. And, and the result is you don't get in trouble, but you also don't get converts. Correct, correct. Because there's no anointing on a coward. It's interesting in Revelation, they have this list. There's this list of all these people who don't make it into right, the city. Right, right, You know, right. it's the sexually immoral, the witches, and the cowards. Right, right. And Jesus is like, my kingdom is not made for cowards. Right, and right. And the cult of empathy is just a bunch of beta males that are cowards. Mm -hmm. They... <laughs> <laughs> My only thought about this whole thing, I'll hand it over to you to just, you know, give us some more, more truth here is that, you know, Mark Driscoll is someone who literally 40 of his own elders wrote a yeah. letter calling him to repent for his abusive and narcissistic behavior. And instead he didn't. And he started another church where he's repeating the same exact sins. So like, forgive me, Mark, if I kind of laugh you know, hard when I hear you talk about repentance, when you haven't even embraced repentance of your own life, you haven't even admitted that, yeah, I have a trail of bodies behind me. Yes, I've acted immorally. Yes, I have exhibited really unhealthy behaviors. Yes, I'm going to submit to my board of elders, all 40 of them, four zero, who wrote a letter mm -hmm. saying that I'm not qualified. But no, for Mark, there's no repentance necessary. Mark does not need repentance. Mark needs people to listen to him. Mark does not mm -hmm. need to exhibit humility. Mark needs to gain an audience for his own clout. So again, this is a great example of how Mark uses these words like repentance, but again, they only apply to specific people 
only people that he thinks need repentance, while he and his friends and the people that he, you know, is hanging out with don't owe the world anything, have no need to repent from any kind of sin of dehumanization or not loving their neighbor, because that would be cowardly and woke. And the last thing I'll say is I'm pretty sure that the Roman guards called Jesus cowardly when he was hanging out on that freaking cross, right? I mean, I'm just saying like this whole coward approach, like, have you read the life of Jesus? The guy gave himself up to in nonviolently and was murdered by the empire. Mm-hmm. Like the guy died. His disciples thought it was over. You know, like he he was the epitome in that moment of what Mark is thinking is a coward, a beta male, a soy boy, someone who didn't fight back. So it's just it's such an inversion. It's such an antichrist way of thinking about the lived Christian experience and what we're all called to. But anyway, I digress. It's all it's all you, Kevin. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's exactly right. I mean, you know, somebody who wasn't an alpha male and that's Jesus. The alpha males in his society were the Romans. I mean, there's no doubt about that. In Roman society, to be a man, to be a vir, is as they, they called it. Uh, so the, the word uh, virtue actually comes from the Roman word virtus, which means manliness. Um, and that is to be the vir was to be in control of your own destiny, in control of your own body, to be the head of a family, to go out and do the public rituals. Like that was what it was to be a man to be the alpha male. Jesus could never have been an alpha male in that society. He's not a Roman citizen. Hmm. He doesn't have control over his own life. If you go back to the birth narrative in Luke, right? The idea that from his birth, his parents are getting pushed around by the Roman Empire. Like they're forcing them to go across land while he's in utero even, right? This is this is not manliness. Um, to be born and placed in a manger is not manliness. And Jesus is teaching when he comes out and he says to his disciples, don't be like those who pray in public. You know who prays in public? The, the Potter Familius, the head of the Roman family. That is the manly thing to do. And Jesus is like, no, don't do that. Mm-hmm. And when Jesus goes to his followers and he says, the last shall be first, the first shall be last. Don't be like those Gentiles who lord it over others. He's talking about that Roman ideal of manliness. Right. He's saying, don't be like those Roman guards who, though they have control of their own bodies, don't really care about anyone else. Mm. Make yourself the servant. And he says, make yourself the slave of other people. That is the slave is not a man in the Roman society. Mm. The slave is a person who is effeminated in the Roman society. And to be crucified is the ultimate in effemination. I mean, what the Romans are doing to you is they're showing you you are not a man. Hmm. That was exactly because if you were a man, you would have had control of your own body. If you were a man, you could have stopped us. If you were a man, you would have fought us. If you were a man, and Jesus is the guy who, according to the Christian tradition, accepts that, right? And the guy who says, rather than fighting against you, rather than defeating you, I want to win you over. And that is not alpha male activity Mm. in his own context. I find this, I find the cult of masculinity to be so strange in Mm. Christianity because it just, it reveals a complete lack of knowledge of anything that was happening in early Christianity and in its own social context. Um, It just doesn't doesn't make sense of anything there. Um, yeah. Great. The, no, I mean, uh, I, nothing to add. If you want to add something else, feel free. Yeah. The other thing that I wanted to say is he, that uh, Driscoll starts that whole little thing out with saying, if the call to repentance precedes the gospel, and I want to, as a Christian theologian, I would want to interrogate that pretty severely. Like if the call to repentance precedes the gospel, does anything precede the gospel? I mean, it seems to me that the gospel is first and repentance is a response to the gospel. Like what God does for you comes first and then you respond to what God has done for you. And that's good theology. I know what uh, what Mark's doing here. He's drawing on the idea of like uh, John the Baptist out, like paving the way for Jesus. But if you look at Jesus uh, with the woman who commits adultery, right? He says, okay, don't throw rocks at her. 
and then says, go and sin no more. Hmm. He doesn't say, okay, do you repent of what you've done? And if you do, then we won't throw rocks at you. Hmm. That's not, that's not the order that Jesus goes at it with, right? You extend grace and then you, you pull the other person in. I just, it seems to me that repentance going before the gospel just puts the gospel secondary and puts judgmentalness first. And that is a theological problem. Russell Johnson is watching. <laughs> he called me while I'm going live. I'm like, Russell, I'm still live talking <laughs> about you, bro. And I'll call you later. I'm busy doing a live. All right, Russell, Jesus. All right, let's keep going. We're almost done. If we really do love people, to tell them that we empathize with them drinking antifreeze because that's their personal choice is not a loving action. Correct. It's it's a, it, it's 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 allowing people, it's supporting people in self-destruction. Right. So, you know, you are your problem. Do you want, I just, do you want, to, okay. do you want to respond to that briefly? Just, just to say, what the hell? Who is, who is telling somebody who's drinking antifreeze that that's okay and they love them? I don't, where is this happening? Well, I think he's comparing it obviously to people who are trans, like gender affirming right. care or calling someone by, by their pronouns. He's comparing drinking antifreeze to affirming someone's <laughs> gender identity, even though we have a lot of data suggesting that by affirming someone's identity, it actually saves their life instead of kills them, right? That would be the, right. the, the big difference here. I mean, this is the thing is that trans people are committing suicide on levels like two to four times their non-trans peers and extending grace to these people is not, um, you know, allowing them to drink antifreeze. It's exactly the opposite. I right. mean, if it, the, the metaphor just runs in exactly the opposite direction as what he's using. And I just think it's so absurd uh, to put it forward in this way. All right, two more clips, friends. We're almost there. Russell, if you're just joining, you're late, bro. We already talked bad about you a long time ago. So just and kidding. good. We you're said some good things. We no, to be fair, and I'll I'll tell Russell this, I'm sure he'll listen to it. We get I think it's clear in this conversation that out of the two, Russell is the one maybe on the on the path of like keep thinking that way, bro. Keep going that way. You know? So yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. We're almost there. Your solution. Right. That's the beginning of the gospel. Right. Um, and most people have never heard that. And when they do, they're offended, but they're intrigued. Yes. Okay, that so is... I want to go back to the, the first claim that he makes here is that you are your problem. You are not your solution. Mm. And I this this worries me, especially because of what I've run into on TikTok in uh, the deconstructing community, the evangelical community, because so many of them, what they took away from evangelicalism was that they were evil to and uh, that right here, uh, right here. Yeah, you know, totally. And this is so so like th there's a sense in which I understand uh, if you wanted to say right? Uh, sin is your problem and there's, there's salvation offered to you in Christ. But saying you are your problem, you are not your solution, is to suggest that you are a problem rather than starting off with you are made in the image of God. Mm. You are, right, uh, just a little bit below the angels. That you are so valuable that God wants to save you. Instead of starting out, he starts out you're the problem. You are not your solution. Again, it's that same kind of thing. Do we want to put judgmentalness first and say that repentance comes before the gospel? Or do we want to surround the entire thing with the gospel? Right? Because it seems to me that from creation all the way through till salvation is the gospel. And sin is a problem in the middle. But it's a problem that is not in your nature. And it is a problem that is going to be fixed. And we need to surround that entire thing with divine love instead of starting out with like you're the problem something that makes people feel like they are evil in their being which is incompatible with the idea that they are created by god yeah i agree um i do want to mention that uh russell has said he wants to apologize for his ostrich boots it wasn't the look i agree russell bad look bro i mean i, I just say put a pair of vans on and call it a day so i appreciate that you're willing to acknowledge your bad wardrobe choices uh so i i embrace your repentance on that all right let's keep going we're almost there two more clips friends thanks for hanging in a little bit of humor there for you i know this is some heavy stuff but it's important that we unpack it and again kevin i appreciate your time on this as well 
you yeah. know, if you're truly going to be true to the gospel, you're going to need to create within the church a countercultural kingdom environment and culture. You right. know, we were talking, I know you and I both are kind of nerding out on Bowen family systems yeah, yeah, and yeah. theory. Um, but within the church system and the culture, like if it becomes, I, I've always said it should be seeker sensible. We should be explaining things to non-Christians in a way that they can understand. Yeah. When it's just like, hey, you know, welcome to our, you know, fellowship. They're like, I don't know what that word <laughs> right, means. You know? Right. Um, but seeker sensitive literally changes the culture, the environment of the church so that the non-Christian feels welcome. But yeah. as soon as that happens, the Christian doesn't. Right. Because like, for example, I've talked to guys recently, they're like, well, how do we walk with the LGBTQIA alphabet soup people? And how do we make Jesus. sure that they feel welcome in our church? Well, they shouldn't. <laughs> if you're a dude in a dress and you show up to men's ministry, you should oh feel very out of place. Sure. And if we create an environment where that guy feels welcome, all the heterosexual guys will feel unwelcome. Right. The open and affirming church, everyone is welcome except for God and everything is welcome except for the word of God. Right. So not true. All, it's ridiculous. All, all people and all beliefs are welcome except for the spirit of God and the word of God. Right. Oh my goodness. Um, just one thought on, on that. Uh, you know, there is, um, there is data and this is, I'm, I'm citing here Bridget Eileen Rivera. She wrote a book called Heavy Burdens. And um, she says that in the book, in, in the research that she's found, um, religious identity and attending religious you know services actually improves the mental health of most people and actually lowers their risk of, of unaliving themselves or unalive ideation. Unless you're queer, and go to a non-affirming space, then your risk of unaliving yourself or unaliving ideation goes up. The only group of people that that are actually harmed by religious spaces are queer people in churches like Marx, right? So like Marx's mm -hmm. whole premise is that they is that the alphabet soup, as he calls them, shouldn't be welcome. I think just shows how his gospel is actually not good news for so many. It's good news for white straight men who want to wear cowboy boots and sit in front of like a faux coffee table that looks like a military installation, trying to pretend mm -hmm. that whenever this existential threat comes to your door, you're going to grab your AR-15 and take down the baddies for Jesus. Like if you're one of those people, Mark's gospel was great news. If you are anyone else, Mark Gos Mark's gospel is absolute horseshit and you should just completely ignore it. In fact, you should just throw it in the trash and set the trash bin on fire and then bury that out in the backyard. I'm just saying like, it's so anti- yeah. It's so antithetical to like so many stories we see. I mean, even the even the story of the Good Samaritan, for example, like flies in the face. It flies in the freaking face of what Mark just said. And Mark really has the audacity to call people alphabet soup, so dehumanizing, and then yeah. denigrate someone who would uh, be, um, you know, would have the bio, would have a penis and wear a dress. And somehow, oh, it's no longer safe for the men in the room, which doesn't make you an alpha male, by the way. Just so we're all clear, alpha males usually can take someone else who's wearing a, a dress that would bend cultural norms that wouldn't trigger most alpha males, unless you're Mark Driscoll. So just had to get that out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, this is John Wesley, who's in you know, my tradition, says the first duty of a Christian is to do no harm. Mm. And, Love uh, that. you know. I mean, like this, this is the, this is the thing is that we Christians have done so much harm, um, by our dehumanizing of people, by our, our not being open. And, and this is the thing, God, you know, being a Christian is all about surprises. It's all about God opening you to new ways of seeing the world. I mean, you think about the Jewish people, right? Sitting around in the first century and, uh, somebody says, you know what, uh, God's going to open the covenant to include a whole bunch of Gentiles who, you know what, they don't even have to follow dietary laws and they don't have to, uh, you know, they don't have to uh, obey the Sabbath laws and, you know, uh, they don't have to get circumcised. And you can imagine the, uh, a, a first century, um, you know, priestly Mark Driscoll sitting there and saying, well, should we make our synagogues comfortable for these Gentiles uh, because they're not following the law? You know, repentance needs to come before they need to change their lives before they come into our communities. And, you know, we don't need to reach out to them and open ourselves up and change the ways that we do things. And the language, actually, this is this has uh, been pointed out. The language that was used of including the Gentiles in the early church was exactly 
the language of accepting something that is not natural into the body of Judaism, right? To take that which is unnatural, those Gentiles, and to graft them into the tree of Judaism. That is exactly where our religion comes from. It is Mm. at the base of our religion to say, you know what? Something that nobody saw coming happened. And it opened up new possibilities for people that thought that, you know, you, we thought you were on the outside, but God mm. brought you in. And that is exactly the, the kind of move. Yeah, you've got to be open to God doing those kinds of things. This is exactly the, I mean, if you want to be a kind of uh, Pentecostal uh, evangelical, open to the movement of the spirit. I mean, this is exactly why John Wesley said, you know what? We've got to have women preachers because Mm. I've seen these women preach and my God, they're moved by the spirit. Mm. And I can say about some of the people that I've gone to church with in affirming churches, right? These people are moved by the spirit and I can't deny that. I can't sit here and watch what they've done for so long, right? Homosexuals participated in church as choir leaders, as participants in all parts of the church and just kept it a secret because Mm -hmm. they couldn't come out. They were moved by the spirit, even when the church didn't accept them. And if the spirit is moving, you don't just turn away from that. You say, God is doing something unexpected and God's grace is surprising us in this moment. That seems to me like that's at the heart of Christianity. I love that. All right, friends, we made it. Here we go. The wrap up, the finale. Thanks again, Kevin. Here we go. I, I think for me, one of the things that COVID revealed is how poor our ecclesiology has been in the Western church. The buffoonery of like, close your church to love your neighbor. It's crazy. It's like, oh, so they're gonna, they're gonna die and go to hell because I love them. Right. And I didn't open the church. I mean, when people are gripped with fear, Mm. they're thinking about death, they're dealing with issues of mortality and the church is like, we're not gonna talk about that because we're gonna be closed. Right. You're missing a massive opportunity. Right. Because even if they don't die of COVID, they're going to die. Correct. And for that window where they're considering death, it's an opportunity to talk about Christ and resurrection and and that the, the end for us is really the beginning. Right. Well, let me just congratulate everyone who's here that we made it. That, that That's it, it, okay? There's no more. Yeah. I have a thought on this, so I'll hand it over to you. I'm not going to okay. go too long on this because I've talked about this at nauseum on other podcasts and stuff. But one of the, the biggest things, and by the way, I should mention, I started TNE uh, December 2021, so uh, co- or December 2020. So COVID was already happening. We I, these thoughts were happening before I quote unquote deconstructed all that kind of stuff. This wasn't when I was some liberal, you know, woke joke as Mark would say. Um, I always thought to myself, even before all this stuff, that yes, in, in evangelicalism, broadly speaking, does have a problem where its churches are event centered instead of community centered. Okay. So, like, we're used to attending this big event and then, like, we kind of go out from there. And when COVID happened, my, and I live in New Jersey, a very liberal state, and they were very strict when it came to their restrictions, I thought, this is actually great. Because now we can break down into very small groups in our homes. I mean, very small, whatever fits in red regulation. And we can meet mm-hmm. in very small groups with a meal and discuss you know, the word and have Eucharist and, and still really actually focus on the community of sticking together during a pandemic. Now, most churches didn't do that. The majority went to the live stream you know, method, which I have so many issues with for a lot of reasons. But like, I yeah. never thought that like church was being shut down. I thought that, oh, it's a global pandemic that we now know, by the way, has killed over and million Americans. Um, And it makes sense that mass gatherings all over the place should be restricted. But luckily for us, the church has taken on all kinds of shapes and forms over the course of church history. And we don't need a building. We don't need 200 people. We don't even need electricity, right, for us to still gather and be the church. So to me, it made no sense when I saw people freaking out saying we're being shut down. Like, well, if by shut down, you mean you can't do your big spectacle thing. Sure, because again, it's a pandemic that is real that has killed people that is incredibly contagious but we can always adapt because that's what the church does so this whole idea from mark and i I, you know john MacArthur. there's so many pastors who who were kind of along this line of like the government was tyrannical no they were not 
Yeah, and by the way, might I say, last thing, then I'll stop. Martin Luther, when the bubonic plague was going on, I, I quoted him when this was happening, literally said that there are some people who are foolish who decide not to stay home and essentially put themselves in harm's way to spread the plague around. They're idiots is pretty much what he says in his own modern tongue, so to speak. I'm paraphrasing severely here, but you get my point. And his point was like, don't be foolish. Like we know that, you know, staying inside and like trying to you know, protect our neighbors is a good idea. So this is not like some new concept. It's not a liberal idea to think that during a pandemic, we want to do all we can to protect our neighbors. But for Mark, it just seems like, no, that's garbage. And how dare the government do what the government's supposed to do during a pandemic to do its best to protect our citizens. That to me, he just mm-hmm. absolutely blows my mind. So for me, what, what struck me immediately about this was, I mean, he's like, what, what people are going to go to hell because I can't open my church. <laughs> yeah, I just, right. I just want to process the hubris of right. a man who thinks that his preaching is like the only thing that, that's saving these people. I mean, like, look, Jesus saved them. I, you, you don't, you can preach, you cannot preach. I don't think that the grace of God is going to succeed or fail on the basis of whether you are, have the opportunity to go and sing your songs. You know what? If, if they don't, God's grace is so great that I'll bet if somebody was stuck at home during COVID and they died and because they had not gone to church that day, they had not had communion or they had not done, God's still going to look at them and say, you know what? It's okay. That's (laughs) fine. Right. right. And you are you do not depend upon Mark Driscoll opening his church to save you. You depend on Jesus having come down, become incarnate in order to save you. That's Jesus's job. It's not Mark's job. So the idea that people are going to hell because Mark would not have been able to open his church just is mind boggling to me. Yeah. Um, the the second thing that, that strikes me is that that Mark sees this as an opportunity, right? Uh, that if you if people are dying and they're thinking about their death, this is the time to get them. And that speaks to me of a gospel that is driven by fear. Mm. Because if you if what you have to preach is right, uh, uh, you're you're going to die, avoid hellfire. You're not preaching life. You're preaching a, a, an avoidance of hell. You're preaching about uh, using God in order to get to where you want to go instead of loving God for what God is, for God's goodness, for Mm. God's intrinsic goodness. And people should not need to be afraid to be motivated by the gospel. And if it's, if you think that getting people when they are afraid is the best time to preach the gospel, then I suspect you're getting the gospel wrong. And that will lead you to trying to make people afraid before you preach to them. And that just, again, strikes me as deeply problematic and and really, uh, at least from my uh, perspective on Christianity, uh, a deeply troubling approach. Although, again, I see people talk about this all the time, the, the kind of preaching of fear and hell and that being the primary thing that drives you into Christianity. And if that's it, I think you've just gotten things wrong. I mean, yeah. if you're not driven by the goodness of God, but by fear of hell, then you've you've gotten your priorities mixed up. Um, Russell's in the chat. He says, I mean, the government did allow mass gatherings to take place as long as you agree with their ideology. I have two thoughts on this, Russell, and you and I have talked about this. This is no secret. I'll tell you what I tell you whenever we text about this stuff. Uh, first off, I dispute that for a lot of reasons. I don't think, I don't think it's that cut and dry. Although certainly there were examples of politicians and, um, people who had connections to government who were able to open up sooner or, you know, do things that were against COVID guidelines to mass outcry, by the way. But even if that was the case, let's just say that it was so corrupt where the government had like a pay to play scheme where certain things were allowed to mass gather, but the church wasn't. Are Christians called to a higher standard or not? 
That, that's what I want to know here. My whole life, it was ingrained into me that Christians always take the high road. Christians love their enemies. Christians are the first ones to forgive. Christians are called to a higher standard, despite what the world does. When the world goes low, we go high. So even if that was the case, which again, I totally dispute, I do not find that a sufficient reason to say, well, that person's doing it. So, hey, let's open up and say government tyranny is, you know, it's that's why we're doing it. It makes no sense to me at all, because again, where's the Christian ethic lie. I was always taught that we don't, we're not like the world, that we don't give into how the world operates. And so for me, I just kind of reject that perspective. And again, this is not a secret friends. Like this is not new to Russell. Russell knows my takes on this. We have literally, you know, um, audio messages that go back and forth 10 minutes long talking about this stuff. But since he brought it up, I did want to at least mention that. Um, I also want to mention a surprise. Um, I'm going to be talking with Russell probably next week about this interview. And we're going to talk about it and just discuss my, his thoughts versus my thoughts as two people who have engaged this content before. Hopefully, friends, if you've been around, you know that we always are looking for good faith dialogue, even with folks that we strongly disagree with. So Russell and I have already talked. We're going to go live sometime next week so you can look out for that. Um, Kevin, anything else you want to add before we get ready to wrap up? Um, no, I just think that... Uh, I don't want to say, uh, you know, to Russell, um, I, I really appreciated those things. As I said, at the beginning of the conversation, I think that a lot of that stuff is stuff where we can overlap. We can agree on all of those things. I just don't see how the rest of it lines up with those kinds of claims that were at the beginning. And I'd love, I, I will tune in to see uh, how he wants to address that because I would love to see him talk about, you know, what does he mean by taking the word of God and using it as a mirror rather than a window into judging other people if, you know, this is what the rest of the discussion looks like. Yeah, I totally agree. All right, friends. Well, listen, it was, uh, Kevin, it was great having you on the podcast. I really like trying to make these things happen to elevate the voices of people like yourself who have studied this stuff and who have really thought through it. I just think it's very important for people to know that there are different ways to be Christian and that you don't have to be stuck in one of these paradigms like Mark Driscoll's who um, only becomes more and more like mind-bafflingly problematic yet continues to grow. To this day, I did a, a, a short video critiquing him on YouTube like maybe six months ago, seven months ago, I still get comments came to this channel to, you know, talk about how dumb this guy is and how great Mark is. I'm like, who are these people? But they exist. Yeah. And again, it is great having you, Kevin, kind of respond to this with me. Keep in touch. I'm sure we'll do it again. All right. Sounds good. All right, friends. Well, there you go. I mean, listen, this was what a two hour and 12 minute broadcast. We pulled like 15 clips to respond to them. I hope this was helpful. Listen, I want to emphasize here, right? Uh, we're not here to dehumanize Mark or, or Russell. And like I said, many times now, Russell and I have become unexpected acquaintances, I think is a fair way of putting it. We definitely chat more than I ever thought we would. And that's important. If we're going to push things forward, we have to recognize that we're breathing the same air. We're on the planet together. It is what it is. We're going to have people that we strongly disagree with. And uh, and by the way, befriending someone who you disagree with does not mean that uh, we capitulate or that we say, oh, yeah, these issues aren't problematic or that, you know, hey, we have to find better ways forward for all of humanity. But I do believe strongly that the way you make change is by having conversations, because I will tell you, my perspectives were not changed when I was still a conservative evangelical who was not affirming. My perspective was not changed by people calling me an asshole online. That never changed my perspective. You know what changed my perspective? It was when people who were queer or friends of mine who understood that my views might have been pretty dangerous took me under their wing as a friend and asked me questions and showed me a better way forward. That's what changed me. So I'm trying to pass it forward. That being said, I do plan on having Russell on the uh, on the live soon. So make sure you give us a subscribe as that way you're notified when that happens. Also, we are a nonprofit organization. We do all of this work, content on Instagram. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. We have a private Facebook community. We do uh, Zoom groups that are private. They're all free. We do everything paywall free because of the generosity of people like yourself. You can donate uh, via the show notes. All donations in the U.S. are tax deductible, and they make this work possible as an organization. All donations are overseen by an accountant and a board treasurer. We post our profit and loss statement on our website so you can see where all the money goes. There are no secrets here. You're simply giving to make this work possible. I appreciate all of you. Would love your feedback. Send me a DM on Instagram if you want more of these. I will talk 
talk to you all later on. Russell, I'm coming for you. We'll talk soon. Have a good one, everyone. See ya.